This is Mighty Med, Disney's weirdest sitcom. The greatest show of all time, and the only true justification for the human race's existence. So let's talk about it as efficiently as possible. Every day's an adventure. You never know what it looks on our face at the school when we enter. We pass early, we work at 3.30, hit the commissary, that's the fun and journey. All these new issues and superpowers. If we didn't have to work, we'd be here for hours. But everybody say that we shouldn't worry. But have you ever seen superheroes on a gurney? Who we say the world today? I'm looking at the camera this time. October 27th, 2013 saw the release of Mighty Med, which aired for 48 episodes across two seasons on Disney XD, before coming to an abrupt cliffhanger ending for controversial reasons. In Mighty Med, comic book nerds Kaz and Oliver, they don't have last names, accidentally stumble upon a top secret hospital for superheroes, accessed through the supply closet of a regular hospital. They see a superhero flatlining and use their vast comic book knowledge to save his life, outsmarting every doctor there. Hold on, if the Crusher's real, then maybe everything we've read about him is real too. And in the latest issue, uh, the Crusher has just returned from the planet Ebrion. Where the gravity is 40 times out of Earth. Maybe the extreme gravity pulled his heart from his chest down to his feet! Oh, they're shocking the wrong place! Yeah, give me those! Clear! Wait, guys, what are you- <laughs> They're quickly recruited by Chief of Staff Horace Diaz to keep working at Mighty Men. Now, alongside their new friend Skylar Storm, a superhero who recently lost her powers, the kids save superheroes, fight villains, and endure their conniving co-worker Alan, all while keeping their new jobs a secret from their friends at school, and from the store owners of the local comic shop, The Domain, who are secretly super villains seeking to destroy Mighty Men. And here it is. This hero in the comments section, this special commenter, correctly identified that the establishing shots used for The Domain are actually just a pretty rundown shopping plaza in San Francisco, California. <laughs> Take him. Take him. <laughs> Yo, California has trash cans too. It's about a block away from Alcatraz. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge from here. I am sorry I called it the San Francisco Bay Bridge last time. I thought they were synonyms. How was I supposed to know? They actually built this bridge based on the climax of Lab Rats season four, episode 20, On the Edge. That show had a big amount of cultural impact. There are a lot of people uh, here just kind of curiously wondering what I'm doing, filming in a public shopping plaza, it's very embarrassing, but this is the Sigma Male content grind set. This is what we do here at YouTube. Let's come along, come along, fam. Let me give you a history lesson. Back in the 2000s and early 2010s, most Disney sitcoms were very simple. What if an everyday teenager accomplished their dreams and moved to the big city while going to school? What if a magical girl had secret powers and had to hide them from the world while going to school? What if a family of six white people had no culture and went to school? But then, one show came along that changed the formula, and you may have heard of it. Lab Rats was this bizarre change of pace which was about three bionic teenagers who went on missions to save the world while going to school. And I don't think Disney had any confidence in the idea at first because the budget was like two cents per episode in the beginning, but it was a huge rating success. And that basically opened the door for Disney to take huger swings, explore wackier concepts, which led to Mighty Med. And this was the wackiest concept yet. What if two teenage boys worked at a superhero hospital and went to school? And that show was greenlit and it aired during the back half of Lab Rat's second season. Coming to Disney XD. Doctor, flame girl's code red. She's supposed to be red, she's made of fire. I found this role in the D-Wing. That's Titania's cyborg arm. Silver shield is flatlining. Just grab a power up to give him an extra life. That only works when he's in the game. Right, public full of Argentia. Stat. Can you believe we get paid to fix superheroes? We get paid? That's just how they operate. New series, Mighty Med, premieres Monday, October 7th at 8, 30, 7, 30 central on Disney XD. This ad has literally nothing to do with the series. That set's not even in the show. I'm 90% sure there's a TIE Fighter sound effect. 
But anyway, the series two-part pilot, Saving the People Who Save People, covers most of what I covered in that opening paragraph. Kaz and Oliver are hanging out at the domain and discussing their favorite superheroes. Would you rather have freeze frames, power to stop time, but you have to talk like a chicken rock, <laughs> or tectons, immunity to pain, but you have to wear a diaper. When comic store owners Wallace and Clyde tell Kaz to stop messing around with their merchandise, Kaz simply ignores them and touches some merchandise, a cardboard cutout of the hero Skylar Storm, whom Oliver has a massive crush on. Unfortunately, Kaz's recklessness causes an accident, although you can hardly blame him for what happens here. You heard Wallace and Clyde. No touching the merchandise. Oh, it's fine. What's gonna happen? Now in the hospital, the two boys notice a man in a trench coat who looks exactly like the superhero Blue Tornado. He enters a supply closet and disappears. They follow him in and crack a top secret code to enter the hospital, which is a slide puzzle. What? It's the symbol of Caduceo, the legendary healer of superheroes! <laughs> Once inside, they're shocked to discover all their favorite superheroes are real. And one of them is in critical condition. Make a path, people! I've got a non-responsive hero. Temperature is 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and he's oozing weird blue glowing stuff! It tastes like hummus. Kaz and Oliver are able to save the hero's life. Let me reiterate that they casually ask this doctor to give them defibrillators, and she does so, and they defibrillate both of the superhero's feet, because his heart has sunken down to his feet due to intense gravity of the planet Ebrion. That's the show. It says, now you die! Uh, do you think they mean you or me? Well, it says you. <laughs> Stupid sign. Oh, know your diet facts. That's far less scary. <laughs> Horace emerges to introduce himself. He's impressed with their performance and allows the two 14-year-olds to remain working at this hospital. <laughs> World's sexiest chief of staff and vice chancellor of medical administration. Bought this at a gas station. What are the odds? Well, he allows Oliver. Kaz, however, is too wild, too unpredictable. Oliver convinces Horace to let Kaz go on a trial run at Mighty Med. And if nothing goes terribly wrong, Kaz will be allowed to stay. Upset about this, meanwhile, is Horace's nephew, the stuck-up, spoiled brat Alan, who despises non-superpowered individuals. What? You're normals? Normos can't know about Mighty Med. I'm gonna get a normal cage! <laughs> Ooh, new slur just dropped. Alan vows to be a thorn in their sides as long as they stay. Ooh, I wonder what this button does. Hmm, nothing. <gasps> Stop nothing! They also meet Skylar Storm, who's recently lost her powers after a brutal battle with the Annihilator. Although she's the third most prominent character of the show, she doesn't do much in the pilot. She's only in a couple scenes. At school the next day, Kaz and Oliver are partnered with their friends Jordan and Gus on a science project, and they promise to dedicate themselves to the project. Now, this is an all-day project, so please keep Gus under control all day. Don't worry, we won't let him anywhere near you. New shampoo? <laughs> However, Right as they're about to start work, Kaz and Oliver are paged to Mighty Med for an urgent emergency and quickly come up with an alibi to escape. Uh, we just have to, um, stop by my grandmother's house. Uh, which is on fire. At Mighty Med, the superhero Tekton has been impaled with a stop sign by the supervillain Megahertz and is being rushed to an emergency surgery. In the operating room, Kaz points out that Tekton has healing abilities and he should just be able to heal himself. So he pulls out the stop sign and Tekton doesn't heal at all. That's the cliffhanger, oh my god! In part two, Tekton's flatlining. Kaz runs back to the domain to skin some comics and remember what Tekton's weaknesses are. Tekton battles the Impaler, gets impaled, obviously, <laughs> and instantly heals. I don't get it. What's not to get? Tekton always heals. See? <laughs> it's why he never loses. See? Unfortunately, he runs into Jordan, who's mad at him and Oliver for ditching the project. If you walk out of here, I will never speak to you again. Seriously, my sister ate my cupcake? I haven't talked to her since January. Kaz casually gaslights her and ditches her again, running back to the hospital with the solution. This probably isn't the best time to tell you this, but, uh, I ate your cupcake and blamed your sister. <laughs> he gets his powers from the 
delta radiation, which emanates from the meteorite in his chest. And his only weakness is Gargalon gas, but doesn't exist on Earth in its natural form. Oh. Well, Gargalon gas is formed when delta, delta radiation reacts with, with gold. gold. Okay, then there must be gold inside of him. Oh. Vicky, gross. Ew. <laughs> What's up, girl? <laughs> They're able to pull the gold out of Tecton's chest and save his life. Unfortunately, Alan leaked to the press that Kaz and Oliver had caused the superhero to nearly flatline at Mighty Med. What are the odds Megahertz was watching at that exact moment? Where is he? Where is Tecton? I'd say 100%. <laughs> it's up to Kaz, Oliver, and Skylar to defeat Megahertz. Hey, Megahertz! There's a storm coming. Skylar Storm. <laughs> Yo, player, you so ugly. <laughs> Finally, Tecton shows up to finish him off, and he congratulates Kaz on a job well done. Oliver promises Skylar that he will help her get her powers back. I, I know you don't like people helping you, but I'm gonna do everything I can to help you get your powers back. That would be great. And this exchange winds up as a primary through line of the show. Back at school, Kaz and Oliver show up at the last minute to use a weapon they stole from Megahertz to get an A on the science project, and the group makes up. But back at the domain, however... I got this money from Mighty Med. Mighty Med? What's that? Uh, My Mighty Med? He's the new rapper. Wallace and Clyde reveal their true nature. See you guys next week. Bye. Toodles. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, our way into Mighty Med. And before long, all the weak superheroes will be dead superheroes. I was shocked by just how constantly energetic this pilot was. Non-stop rapid-fire gags, most of which were actually funny. Going into this, I was fully prepared to make a video called, like, How Mighty Med Failed to Capture Labrat's Magic or something. Because going into this, my only experience with the show was the crossover with Labrats, where the show just seemed like Labrats, but cheaper. But let me tell you, that crossover did Mighty Med so dirty. It's great. It's inspired by Labrats, but better in every way. I remember watching one episode of Mighty Mad as a kid at my friend's house that the same friend who introduced me to Lab Rats, it didn't really appeal to me at the time. I don't know which episode it was. So I went into this Mighty Med rewatch completely blind. I wasn't constantly checking the Wikipedia page in a different tab, seeing how many appearances the characters would have left like I was with Lab Rats. I just took a blind leap of faith into this bizarre series and I could not be more pleased with the results. And here we are at Logan High School, which is actually Doris Place Elementary School in Los Angeles, California. When I made a community post asking where these locations might be, this commenter replied, I swear, within seconds, as if they've known for years that the school from Mighty Med is Doris Place Elementary School in Pasadena, California. And they, they've been waiting for literal decades to share that information with the world. That's, what, that's my head cannon. So thanks for sharing that with us. Now we know. Last time we filmed at a school, I got a hundred comments saying, hey, get a microphone, get a microphone. Well, I'd like to point out that um, if I didn't have a microphone, the video would have sounded like this. So obviously I had a microphone. As a matter of fact, we had a very good one. I had rented a roughly $1,000 Sennheiser lapel mic. You can see it in some shots. Uh, Trinity was, uh, uh, she had the headphones and the receiver. She said it sounded good. And it did! So, and then we uh, recorded it, and, um, well, we were like, all right, cool, sounds good. And then I got home, and I listened to all of the footage, and it sounded like this. But because this is an episodic sitcom, his personality is locked. Donald Davenport's AI security system. So I decided to go with the in-camera audio because it was either piercing metallic static that recorded to, like, half a channel or some wind. So um, we did have a microphone. I think the lesson is that 
Uh, it doesn't matter how spicy and fancy your equipment is. If you're a, an idiot, um, uh, it won't turn out good. Let's talk about the characters in Mighty Med. According to the theme song, the main characters of Mighty Med are Kaz, Oliver, Skylar, and Alan. But let's get one thing straight right off the bat, okay? Alan is not at their level. They're in every episode. He's in like two out of three, okay? And I'd also like to point out, Horus is 100% a main character. He's in more episodes than Alan, or at least the same amount. And he's featured way more prominently than Alan. So I don't know who was responsible for omitting Horus from the theme song, but I'm putting him up here because he, you know, if Alan's the main character, so is Horus. Bradley Stephen Perry plays Kaz. He is the protagonist of the show. Technically the show, like, treats him as if he's on the same level of protagonism as Oliver, but they give him a lot more to do, and he's a lot more dynamic and interesting and fun, so that they just use him more. I take responsibility for my actions. <laughs> Wasn't me, he did it. <laughs> he is mischievous, he has a childlike sense of humor. He constantly tries to see how much he can get away with, just solely out of amusement and entertainment from the situation. I can't believe we have to eat all the expired DNA samples. <laughs> what are you doing? Horace didn't say we have to eat them, he just said get rid of them. Yeah, I know, but the trash can's all the way over there. You cannot talk about his performance without talking about how Bradley Stephen Perry plays him. Insanely charismatic. Oliver, your backpack stinks! I know. Stop putting your gym shoes in here. <laughs> Where else am I gonna put them in my backpack? They stink. He jumped on this series right after the ending of Good Luck Charlie. And if this were Lab Rats, I would say that he carried the entire show on his back. But he is actually surrounded by an insanely talented ensemble cast beyond what you see here. So he is just one excellent actor in a lineup of really excellent actors in Skyler. Brain Matter checked into the hospital years ago, but never checked out. Oliver, played by Jake Short, is Kaz's best friend. He's a bit more cautious and rule-abiding than Kaz is. He definitely comes across as a lot younger and more naive, even though they are intended to be the same age. Oliver is often defined by his huge, sometimes obsessive crush on Skylar. Hi, I'm Oliver, big fan of your work. You have so many amazing powers. To the A, to the M, to the B. Sometimes it's mutual, Sometimes it's not. The show it didn't make up its mind. No way! You were just making out with the cardboard cutout of her. No, I wasn't. <laughs> Skylar Storm, played by Paris Barelk, Paris Barelk, is an alien from another world. She was once a powerful superhero, but now she's pretty much a normal after her powers were drained in a battle with the Annihilator. Yesterday, I was ambushed by the Annihilator. He neutralized my powers, took my invisible flying motorcycle, he even stole my costume! He left me just standing there in my underwear. <laughs> she is constantly used for like fish out of water jokes. Pim! He's in danger, I need to save him! Why is everyone so upset? Look at the sign. Thou's Principal Kraus. Her full name is actually... <laughs> she is basically like Phoebe from Magic School Bus, where she's constantly like, this didn't happen at my old school, except she dresses terribly and Phoebe dresses great. You might notice as the show goes on that everyone is a fantastic actor and she's there. Any place is better than this, except the lava pits of Kelnor. The lines there are so long. She's, 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 she's present. You will not defeat me! Next up is Alan, played by Devin Leos. He's like Arnold from the Magic School Bus. He's like that yellow kid from Polar Express. He's like Neville from iCarly. He's like Bradley from Milo Murphy's Law. We all know someone like Alan, or at least we all did in elementary school, and we all wish we didn't. You can't tell anyone about Mighty Men. It's a top secret hospital. Alan, stop interrupting. He's just a snobby, stuck up little like, I'm actually kiddo. Um, he hates normos with a passion. Uh, he's very casually racist, but only against normos. Superheroes and normos don't mix. They're like sugar and water. Sugar and water mix incredibly easily. What are they teaching you at your school? Oh, I'm supposed to be homeschooled. 
by you. <laughs> He's a character that could become annoying if played by the wrong actor, but the show makes fun of him a lot, and the actor just plays him very, very well. He never really becomes grating, even though he so easily could, because the show just strikes a good balance with his character. Ooh, Uncle Horace, I've got to have one of these cool Visitech hologram watches. Everybody in the superhero world has one. Not everyone has one. But I do. For no reason in particular, the character just constantly yells, What? 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 I imagine like they just had it in the script once the first time, and then he said it funny, they all laughed, and they just kept putting it in the script as it went on. What? And I'd like to point out, that's literally something that I say. Like on my main channel, my Transformers channel, there's instances of me just saying, What? In the exact same tone and manner. Issue 7, what? What? I did not realize that issues 7 and 8 were not drawn by Burcham. Because that was based off an old video from a Transformers convention in 2009 where someone saw the late art director of Transformers Animated, Derek J. Wyatt, through a window, rest in peace, man, and he yelled, what? At looking at the toy of the guy. And what? <laughs> what? So I just thought that sounded funny, and so I started saying it. I adapted it into my speech repertoire, all right? my phrase library, if you will. And then all of a sudden I saw someone in Mighty Med saying it with the same delivery and I was like, what the hell? I don't know if that fact was worth sharing, but I did. Chief of Staff Horace Diaz, played by Carlos Lacamara. Carlos Lacamara? He's absolutely incredible. I want him to be my grandpa and my husband at the same time. Every single line delivery he says is just so funny. It's so incredible. Whatever you do, do not open that door. It is the door of doom. Now we're having problems with the lock, so I need you to open every door in Mighty Man. <laughs> okay, okay, stop! He is this show's Davenport, but he's actually like an unabashedly really, really good person who's just doing his best. I'm also waxing the floors right now. <laughs> I just wanted to bring you a snack. But now I can watch! Mr. Valentine, we encourage parents to get involved, but they usually don't show up to school unannounced. I can't help it if the other parents don't love their children. <laughs> Sorry, but they don't. He decides to let two random 14-year-olds work at the hospital just because he sees their potential. And he even pays them. Which is what a man. I have a question for you. Is it important? Probably not. Can you have my full attention? He is the greatest character who has ever been in any work of fiction. And for no reason whatsoever, he loves bridges. This is a web untangalizer for our arachnid-based superheroes. This is a molecular devaporizer. A lot of people get vaporized in this business. This is a picture of a bridge. I love bridges! I love bridges! I love bridges! I love surprises and bridges. If I don't make it, just remember I love... Yes, Uncle Horace? I love... bridges. <laughs> I was expecting this to become a plot point uh, uh, eventually. It never did. There was just no context or reasoning. It just, again, it reminds me of like Phineas and Ferb style jokes where they just have the running gags to have running gags and that's it basically. This is an almost perfectly cast show, all right? These are not actors. These are not characters. They are 100% real when you watch Mighty Med. You love them. You want, you want to be best friends with every single one of them, and you want to punch Alan, but that's the point of Alan. So they all did a good job. The easel broke. The easel, the easel just broke. <laughs> now we reach a line of like major recurring characters who are in like one out of four, one out of five episodes. Um, first up is Gus. How would I describe Gus? So Jordan, want to see my umbilical cord? I keep it in my wallet. Once again, he's another archetype of someone that we all went to elementary school with, but we haven't seen him since sixth grade when his parents unenrolled him to homeschool him. But only if you bring free sandwiches. And hold the mayo. Fine. No, seriously, hold the mayo. <laughs> Thank you. This backpack's so much lighter with only one jar of mayo in it. He is an odd and a creepy child Someone that is fun to watch on TV, but you would never want to meet in person. He gives a choking dog the Heimlich, and he's a hero. I give a healthy dog mouth to mouth, and I'm a weirdo. <laughs> Augie Isaac plays the character very well. Uh, once again, the show strikes a balance. He never becomes too much. 
A skeeter's close, but it doesn't skeeter over the line. It's a good, good show, good guy, good, good Gus. Jordan hates everyone, but only in a passive aggressive way, never in an outwardly aggressive way. No, I don't. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Her actor, Cozy Zulsdorf. <laughs> Okay, normally every actor in these Disney shows is named like Matt Smith or something. Like up until Corey Zulslerf, I'm pretty sure Bridget Mendler had the weirdest name in the Disney Channel cinematic universe. Anyway, she's very funny. I don't want to hear any negative talk out of you. That's my thing. So, if anyone's going to tell you you're gonna get crushed like a bug, it's going to be me. Talk about tough love. I like to think of it more as soft hate. She'll be there to cheer on a school play as it crashes and burns. Jordan, help me out here! Are you kidding? You're doing horrible! Oh, tears. Actual tears of joy. She'll like pay someone to be a stand-in for her so Gus can annoy the stand-in instead of her. That one cost me a month's allowance, but best money I ever spent. She's funny. She's good. Excellent character. And next up, we reach Wallace and Clyde. We'll take that, thank you, boys. You know the rules in this shop. Yeah. I don't know which one is which. I might have just pointed to Clyde and said Wallace. I might have pointed to Wallace and said Clyde. Who cares? I'm Clyde. I'm Wallace. It's not that hard. Mm. Oh, I love the fresh smell of new comics. Mm, this new batch smells like lavender. That's actually my cologne. It really smells nice. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's the new texture issue. Oh! Now, I'm just gonna rip the Band-Aid off. This is the largest amount of sexual tension I've ever seen emanating from a pair of twin brothers. That was the most important thing in my life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. More important than your brother who makes you soup? You are so ungrateful. I cannot believe I gave you my kidney. Bean soup. <laughs> then later I discovered they are played by real life twins, Randy and Jason Sklar, which made me feel weird that that was my first thought, but it was. She sees a woman of unearthly beauty. Ah! I was straight up expecting Mighty Med to pull a brothers to lovers trope, but they didn't. Delicious smoothies. <laughs> Anyways, they are secretly the evil supervillain Catastrophe, and they are plotting to take down Horace Diaz and Mighty Med. Ah, Wallace. Remember how Horace Diaz erased our memory of where Mighty Med is? Do I remember Horace Diaz erasing my memory? <laughs> Actually, I don't. He erased my memory of erasing my memory, remember? <laughs> Actually, I don't. Will they? Uh, who knows? Well, you have these superheroes arranged alphabetically. I like them arranged in the order that I'm gonna hunt them down and massacre them. <laughs> Except for this guy. I like his cape. So those are the nine characters that you see most commonly in Mighty Med, and unlike Lab Rats, anyone could lead an episode storyline with anyone. Like in Lab Rats, it was always for Leo and Bree do this while Adam and Chase do this. You'd never see Principal Perry leading a storyline or anything. Meanwhile, in Mighty Med, there's a whole subplot where Jordan and Gus rescue a frog from a classroom science lab so it can escape dissection. There's a whole episode where Wallace and Clyde lead a Villains Anonymous session. Alan might pitch a comic book to Wallace and Clyde. Jordan might compete with Skylar in a Dungeons and Dragons contest. Oliver and Kaz are often together, but I think the show lets them have like an individual subplot on their own with every single character here, each of them. I think the show had like a checklist of every possible character interaction they could get between these nine because they all happen. All of them are just perfectly cast, okay? If I were to put them on a tier list, all of them would be an S tier. Oliver would be an A. Skylar would be down in C. Like, Skylar's mid. Skylar's storm is the textbook definition of mid. I'm sorry if you disagree with that, but it's just the truth. <laughs> They're all simultaneously the greatest character in Mighty Med, whereas everyone in Lab Rats was the worst character in Lab Rats. This show is also very different from Lab Rats in the sense that beyond just these nine, there are a ton of supporting characters. I'm defining that as just characters who have prominent speaking roles in more than one episode. In Lab Rats, by the end of the first season, excluding the eight main guys, there were six other supporting characters in total. Trent the Bully, Stephanie the Cheerleader, Bree's boyfriend Ethan, Bree's friend Caitlin, Leo's girlfriend-ish Janelle, and at the very, very end, Marcus. Half of those never even appeared again. Lab Rats barely had any characters. Mighty Men, meanwhile, has so many 
almost every episode introduces some new superhero, and the majority actually do return later. There's no formal reintroduction to them or their powers, we're just expected to remember them from last time. I won't bother introducing every single superhero, I'll get to them if slash as I get to them, and that's not even all. You see, the show pays such extreme attention to his characters, to the point where extras are relevant and you need to pay attention to them. There's like 10 to 20 superheroes who consistently appear in the background of like one third of the episodes. They're always called by name and asked to help out with stuff, and are characters that we consistently see every few episodes in prominent roles, at least for extras. There's even building storylines around the extras. Why did I trade for the Crusher the week before his wedding? Guy's so distracted! <laughs> Since the Crusher got married, his wife won't let him do anything dangerous. Good news! My wife made spinach dip in a bread bowl! Oh, jeez. The fact that the show cares this much about the side characters is so endearing to me, and it says a lot about the writer's engagement with this material. And now let's talk about that material, shall we? Let's dive into season one of Mama, or Mighty Med, as the kids say. You never know by the looks on her face at the school when we- Boy, oh, we all did we fly away instead? You never know, but you know we might have met team up, so let's go! Every episode of Mighty Med has an extremely loose premise that mostly just serves as a springboard for a ton of jokes and gags and they consistently incorporate comic book elements into the storyline. Unlike Lab Rats, I think we'll actually walk through these episodes one at a time in order, although there's still plenty of episodes I'll have less to say about than others. In episode 3, Friday Med, Kaz and Skyler search for the long-missing superhero Brain Matter, but Horace quickly shuts down their concerns. I was wondering why there aren't any more stories about Brain Matter. What happened to Brain Matter? <gasps> I keep doing that every time I say Brain Matter. <gasps> Stop meddling! I have some important work for you to do. Change light bulbs, clear away cobwebs. This is just busy work. No, it isn't. The title of the list is Busy Work for Kaz! More importantly, he tells them to avoid opening the door of doom. Now we're having problems with the lock, so I need you to open every door in Mighty Man. <laughs> They open every door, but they still don't find brain matter. However, Kaz opens the freezer and sees a box of tofu pops, which is sadly empty. Behind that, he finds a frozen and shrunken brain matter, who thaws and grows to scale. The last thing I remember, I, I was conducting an experiment on myself. Something went terribly wrong, but I can't remember what. Brain Matter transforms into a terrifying monster and terrorizes the hospital. Horace explains that years ago, Brain Matter accidentally transformed himself into a monster and had to be contained. I had heard the rumors, so I went to investigate, but I was too late. Wait, 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 wait. This happened in the 1970s? No, this was five years ago. He was hidden behind the tofu pops because that's the last place a sane person would look. Kaz, Skyler, and Horace have to lure Brain Matter away from the hospital. In the B-plot, Oliver is struggling to explain to his father where he's been going after school every day. You make up an after-school activity, something that sounds productive so he'll get off your case, but so boring he won't ask for details. Where'd you come up with that? Oh, an alibi club. Yeah. <laughs> and if anybody asks, that's where I am right now. He comes up with a lie and says he's in an after-school play. However, when his dad wants to come see the play, Oliver panics and has to throw together an actual play. Massive shout out to the stagecraft class for throwing this up in one day. In front of a live audience and without a script, Oliver humiliates himself in a very typical high school play performance. If you're in high school, your plays are terrible. You think they aren't, they are. Brain Matter chases Kaz all the way to the school and onto the stage, which means that Brain Matter chased Kaz through a public hospital, through the city, and into the school. Kaz was leading the chase, and he made the conscious decision to run on stage during a play. We love that. They all trap him in the coffin, and the day is saved. Don't worry. I've seen enough movies to know this is the part where the audience thinks it was all part of the show and loves it. Cue applause! <laughs> In the end, Oliver learns that his father didn't even come to see the play, and it was all for nothing. Their parents are just hilariously, completely irrelevant and absent from the whole show. 
and I honestly find that to be an extremely charming part of this series. Episode 4, I Normo, is fascinating because it develops the show's main storyline a little bit too far and too early, and the show basically has to backtrack later and pretend this hasn't happened yet. When Kaz has a crush on Stephanie, a snobby rich girl at the school, wait a minute, he's turned down in an epic manner, and then opts to make Stephanie jealous by pretending he's dating Skylar at the school carnival, who is now attending the normal school under the fake identity of Connie Valentine. Skylar misunderstands social cues left and right, greatly embarrassing Kaz. In the B plot, Gus is a magician at the carnival, and he traps Oliver in a cage with no means of getting him out. In the C plot, Alan tries to prove himself as a doctor. When the superhero Titanio develops amnesia, this is a cool mech suit costume by the way, Alan treats him, but he's consistently wrong and causes Titanio to think he's the supervillain Black Falcon and deservingly attack Alan. There's also a remarkably good looking CGI eye on the superhero Owl Girl. She's just an extra, but she's present throughout the whole show. Threads converge when Skylar realizes Kaz was using her and sadly sits on the stairs. Oliver meets her and assures her that he cares about her a lot. I said I'd have your back and I didn't. I'm a terrible friend. It's all right. You have nothing to worry about. And then, four episodes in, Skylar actually kisses Oliver. And the two of them have this awkward high schooler relationship closeness by the end of the episode and then is never mentioned again. And for the rest of season one, Oliver has a one-sided Isabella-style crush on Skylar with no signs of reciprocation. And even later in the season, she kisses him again, and the show treats this like it's the first time it ever happened. So the show apparently just played its cards too early here in episode four. The writers wrote themselves into a corner, and by the time they really figured out what they wanted this character dynamic to be, I guess their solution was just to pretend it never happened. I'd like to also briefly talk about how Mighty Med is actually shot like an actual show sometimes. In Lab Rats, everything was flat, the camera was always generically far away from everyone at all times, but here, in Mighty Med, there's motivated close-ups and long shots. Like the most basic level of thought went into the filming style and the shot composition. It doesn't quite last, I think the show sort of loses its visual style as each season goes on with only a handful of fleeting moments throughout the rest of the episodes. But the comedy of the show never falters across all 48, and that's arguably more important. In Smolliver's travels, Oliver saves the life of Stephanie's pet dog, and she adopts him into her popular clique. When a jealous Kaz sees Oliver's ego getting the best of him due to being in Stephanie's clique, he decides to bring him down to size, quite literally by shrinking him. When Horace is having trouble performing surgery on the impenetrable superhero Citadel, they decide to send Oliver inside of him to perform the surgery himself. But he gets held hostage by Citadel's archenemy, Micros, who shrunken himself down to destroy Citadel from within. This one actually beat the Rick and Morty go inside someone episode by two months. Meanwhile, Gus comes up with a plan to become popular. I've come up with an incredible idea to create a viral video that'll make me the most famous person in the world! Cool, what's the idea? To create a viral video that'll make me the most famous person in the world! It involves a pack of tigers and a suit of beef. And Wallace and Clyde place a tracking device in Kaz's backpack for him to lead them to Mighty Med. Excuse me, under ailment, there's no box for viral video shoot with tigers goes terribly wrong. <laughs> it's at this point that the show engages in some bold editing choices that I have no choice but to applaud. And it happens again to clarify that this was an intentional stylistic decision and not a mistake. When Kaz's backpack accidentally gets switched with Gus's, Wallace and Clyde track Gus to the hospital and almost discover Mighty Med, but don't. Oliver defeats Micros and Stephanie just forgets about him by the next day, now adopting Gus into her clique instead because of his popular video. The end. Pranks for Nothing is the third episode in a row that steals its premise from a Lab Rats episode. Hi, I'm Bree. I Let's like be ponies friends. and girl things. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oliver and Kaz learn that pranks don't exist on Skylar's home planet of Caldera, so they mess with her to teach her. However, this happens while the ultimate superhero, the Great Defender, is inspecting the hospital. He's played by Dwight Howard, a sports person. They prank him, and since he enjoys it, he decides to prank them back as well. I spun the earth on my finger, like this. <laughs> but bigger, because it's the earth. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll just spin the earth in the opposite direction. Oh, oh no. My powers, they're, they're not working. That's why I'm here in the hospital. If you can't fix it, what'll happen? The planet will spin into the sun, destroying the earth and everything going in. That's what you get for pranking me, Cass. This is all your fault. Cass and Oliver prepare to launch into space to save the Earth. But it turns out that all of this was a massive prank on Kaz and Oliver, arranged by Skylar, Boris, and the Great Defender to get revenge on them for pulling pranks on everyone earlier. In the B-plot, Alan is tasked with babysitting the Great Defender's daughter, a shapeshifter. She turns into a cup to annoy Alan, and accidentally gets dropped in a garbage compactor, so Alan has to leap in to save her. I gave this to my Uncle Horace for his birthday. He said he loved it. After bonding with the girl and saving her life, we learn that the girl wasn't even the Great Defender's daughter. No, this is the Great Defender's kid. She's been alone all afternoon. Then who have I been babysitting this whole time? That's Jamie, Bernice from Accounting's daughter. Why were you watching her? Alan just assumed the first black girl he saw was his daughter and immediately began babysitting her. Uh, he's very casually racist, but only against normos. Then Horace reveals that the entire thing was an elaborate prank on Alan. The Great Defender doesn't even have a kid? <laughs> I love pranks! It's a good show. After the previous episode dealt with world-ending stakes, the next episode also does that. Episode 7, appropriately titled, Is Not the End of the World, sees Horace's psychic cousin Timeline, also played by Carlos Lacamra, visit the hospital while Horace is gone. Wrong! <laughs> Cass takes advantage of his powers to glean into the future and has fun with them. Finish this quote. It was the, the best, best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. Kind of a run on sense, if you ask me. When was Charles Ch Dickens was born on February 7th, 1812, in Portsmouth, England, which is situated 64 miles southwest of London, or 103 kilometers for you fans of the metric system. What? character still wears a faded wedding dress after Ms. being Miss Havisham from Great Expectations. Oh, and uh, speaking of wedding dresses, you might not want to spend too much on yours because her fiance Bruce will be breaking off the engagement tonight. <laughs> oh, but it's all for the best because on Tuesday he gets arrested for identity theft, so you might want to cancel your credit cards. <laughs> However, when Timeline realizes that an apocalypse is about to start, Kaz has to follow the warning signs and stop it before it's too late. I hate to break this to you, but Crimson Demon is just a kid in a mascot costume. Wait for it. <laughs> Oliver, meanwhile, has become jealous when Skylar seems to have a crush on Gus throughout the episode. But in a classic sitcom moment, the whole thing was simply a misunderstanding. I don't want to go out with Gus. I've just been a little homesick lately, and he reminds me of a Dornbosch. The pets we have on my planet? <laughs> wow. The resemblance is uncanny. The students on the drums and cymbals are not making impact with their instruments whatsoever. It makes me so happy. I love this. In episode 8, evil Gus. Gus contracts a strange illness, so Kaz and Oliver bring him into Mighty Med for treatment. However, the vaccine they give him turns him into a villain who rampages around the hospital and has to be stopped. Meanwhile, Horace has to pretend to be Connie, Skylar's parent, on parent-teacher night since she doesn't otherwise have one. What? You want him to pretend to be your father? 
Alan, stay out of this. What? You want me to pretend to be your father? But he winds up taking his role a little bit too far and becomes an unwanted parent who disturbs the campus constantly during school hours. And by BFF, she means best father forever. I'm not implying your fathers aren't good. I'm bluntly saying it, they aren't good. I think the most notable thing about this episode is that Kaz says he doesn't know odds. I mean, the odds are like... 12. <laughs> I don't know how to do odds. But back in episode one, he clearly did. What are the odds Megahertz was watching at that exact moment? Where is Tecton? I'd say 100%. This honestly ruined the whole show for me. I hope someone got fired. In episode nine, Alan's Reign of Terror, Oliver becomes concerned that Alan might become a super villain eventually because Horus doesn't give him enough attention. And he convinces Horus to put Alan in charge for the day while he's away. Horus agrees. And the moment he leaves, Alan turns the hospital into a dystopian regime. Now listen up, drones. From now on, everything's going to change. Starting with, no more calling me Alan. Call me Chief Executive Senior Prime Minister International Supreme Overlord of Mighty Med. I hate bridges! Horus was right to neglect this child. Everyone is tortured by Alan, and Oliver, Skyler, and a lizard man named Lizard Man get trapped in Dimension Zero. This episode also references The Great Defender from a couple episodes ago, so while these are totally standalone episodes, they openly acknowledge each other, a lot like Phineas and Ferb. Meanwhile, Kaz challenges Clyde for his high store in a game called Asteroid Assassin. If I win, I get one of every Tecton collectible in the store for free. Even the Tecton Tectons? Even the Tecton Tectons. <laughs> Deal! 7 p.m. tonight. Be there. Jordan decides to up the stakes, deeming that he'll be banned from the domain forever if he loses. That was your plan? To get me and Oliver kicked out? Why would you do that? I'm just testing ideas for a new video game I'm creating. It's called Angry Friends. There's a cool paralleling climax as the Mighty Med Rebellion fights to take down Alan while the others play a video game. At the end, even though Kaz loses, Wallace reminds Clyde of something important. Hold on, Clyde, a word please. We can't banish Kaz and Oliver, okay? We need them around so they can lead us to Mighty Med. Oh yeah, I totally forgot. I got so worked up. So Kaz is allowed to stay a customer of the domain. This is basically their role for most of the season. A bunch of subplots that have nothing to do with Mighty Med, and then a shoehorned mention of the fact that they're evil and looking for Mighty Med just so the audience doesn't forget. We will take our revenge on Dr. Horace Diaz. You wanna dial it down? Your glow is showing. Sorry. <laughs> In episode 10, So You Think You Can Be a Sidekick, Oliver becomes Tecton's sidekick. However, he's just given medial, boring, and often extremely dangerous tasks to do. This job is horrible. All I do is his chores. This morning, I had to make his bed. It's on the ceiling! A jealous Kaz. A lot of sentences in this script begin with a jealous Kaz or a jealous Oliver because they're jealous little bitches, man. Kaz wants to be Tecton's sidekick instead, and Oliver wants a way out, so they both come up with a plan to pretend Oliver has been captured by Megahertz to convince Tecton that Oliver simply can't handle it so that Kaz can become the sidekick instead. First, details on Tecton's sidekick Oliver, who was abducted today. You really expected me to believe this? I was hoping. <laughs> Tecton doesn't believe them at all. And then, Oliver actually gets captured by Megahertz. Why do we have to do all the hard work? Meanwhile, Oliver gets to just put his feet up and hang. <laughs> so, with Tecton not believing them, Kaz and Skylar have to rescue Oliver. Meanwhile, Alan wants to become a superhero himself, and he forms a pact with Benny, the awkward nurse we saw in the pilot. He and I have the same personal trainer. How is that possible? They're just kind of cringe for a while. Magnificent man and what's his face? They do stuff. <laughs> They're cringe. All forces converge, and Megahertz is finally defeated. Ooh, that looks like it mega hurts. Alan becomes Tecton's intern instead in the end, forced to do all the dangerous and scary tasks that Oliver had to. 
Because Alan's destiny as a character is to suffer, rightly so. Stop pulling, bad dog! Is that Tecton's invisible dog? Yeah, and let me tell you, what comes out of him is not cute and is not invisible. <laughs> In the episode Lockdown, Kaz is throwing a surprise party for Oliver at the Domain. And just when he tries to get him to come to see it, a security lockdown at Mighty Med forces everyone to stay inside, as a supervillain cloud called Revengeance attempts to possess the nine Mighty Med administrators in order for them to restore his human form. Now, Oliver and Kaz have to defeat him, as Kaz repeatedly tries to get him and Oliver to sneak out, while Oliver repeatedly gets annoyed at Kaz for forgetting his birthday. This is how my brother got out of jail! Are these episodes just blurring together in your head after a while? Like, they're all distinct, but they're also, like, not. In the meantime, Wallace and Clyde host a Villains Anonymous session next door to the party planners. Wallace insists that maybe they should turn good, become good guys. Clyde, I want to turn non-evil, and I think you should too, alright? The non-villain world can be quite delightful. Just the other day, I helped an old lady across the street instead of pushing her into the street. <laughs> she said thanks instead of... <gasps> and it's funny to me that the show's already toying with the idea of them getting redeemed before they've initiated their master plan. Normally in shows, that's supposed to happen after they do their plan. At their circle is a former villain called The Exterminator. Now he's just Ed. Hi, I'm, I'm Ed, uh, formerly The Exterminator, now just an exterminator. <laughs> that one's on the house. This was during that classic golden era where Patton Oswalt showed up in absolutely everything for no reason, just because he could. You see that guy? That was me 10 years ago, the exterminator. Ultimately, Villains Anonymous goes poorly. Ed goes evil again because no one remembered his birthday. I had no friends, never got invited to a birthday party, never even had one of my own. Three, two, what? Surprise! I am stunned. This, this whole thing was a trick to, to get me to come to my own surprise party? Oh, it happened! It finally happened! Oh, this isn't for you. It's a party for my friend Oliver, and you're not invited. Calm down. You're among friends here. If you were my friends, you would have thrown me a birthday party. <laughs> No, that's it. I'm, I'm going back to a life of evil. We all should. I mean, together, we could exterminate everyone on the planet. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute, guys, guys, where are you going? We, this is catered. We've got food here. Come on, guys, please. Guys, you can't fall off the wagon like that. Wow. Ed already pushed an old lady into the street. <laughs> he didn't waste any time, did he? No, he did not. At the end, everyone's left by the time Kaz and Oliver escape the domain. They apologize and make up for the 100th time, and there's thousands more to go. In all that, Kaz, Horace posts a list of every staff member in the hospital ranked from most valuable to least valuable. I make the rankings public because I'm bored. And I love drama! Which, as proven by Survivor, is an absolutely incredible premise for an episode. Real workplaces should be doing this. Kaz is ranked number one and a jealous Oliver is second to last. When a telepathic superhero named Neocortex checks into the hospital, Oliver convinces him to telepathically give him Kaz's personality, which now causes Oliver to be the most popular person in the hospital, causing Kaz to be jealous. Kaz tries to make Neocortex turn Oliver back, but Oliver, who doesn't want to change back, reflects Neocortex's power back at him, causing his neural nuclear reactor to go nuclear and threaten to destroy the entire hospital, and presumably the normal hospital next door. Now, with no rational-minded Oliver in sight, Kaz has to mentally become Oliver in order to cure Neocortex before he explodes. Meanwhile, Skylar has the normal flu and suddenly finds herself flying in the air. Alan mistakenly believes that her powers are somehow returning and decides to experiment on Skylar himself, thinking that if he were to make a scientific breakthrough with her powers, Horace would be impressed with him. Maybe my Uncle Horace will take down all these signs. <laughs> of course, Alan is stupid, and Skylar flying is just a normal side effect of a Calderon having the Norma flu. It looks like she's just asleep, which is a big improvement from your last three patients. <laughs> A new 
Mighty Man tackles a secret agent. Episode 13, the friend of my friend is my enemy, is like the first actually important episode to the story of the show as a whole. When Skyler's close friend Experion arrives to visit from Caldera, Oliver is immediately jealous and suspicious. He thinks Experion's trying to hurt Skyler, and the typical sitcom thing happens. Oliver tries to investigate him for a while, eventually goes, huh, I guess I was wrong, and then we learn that he was right. Experion betrays Skylar and tries to bring her to the Annihilator, the villain who stole her powers. Oliver and Kaz arrive to save the day. This fight scene is the first time Mighty Med tries to present itself as genuinely epic and badass and cool. The previous episodes have all been completely goofy, and man, it doesn't quite work. <laughs> Uh, we still be friends? Sure! <laughs> oh, her. In the B-plot, Alan wants a bit more attention, and he decides to pitch a comic book to Wallace and Clyde, a comic about Mighty Med, which reveals the location of the hospital. Classic Alan. They're busy and eagerly dismiss this weird loser. Alan tries to pitch it to Gus, but Gus doesn't like it either. He tries to verbally pitch the comic, but that doesn't work as well. My comic is about a not at all awkward superhero who works at a top secret hospital called Mighty Med. He toils under the reign of his far less attractive bridge loving uncle. And the twist is that the location of this top secret superhero hospital is actually inside a. In the end, Alan is upset about not getting the proper acknowledgement, and he leaves the comic on a shelf in the domain. Both the A-plot and B-plot of this episode will go on to nicely set up the A-plot and B-plot of the Season 1 finale, making these the first Keystone episodes if you count that as a season-long storyline. In Atomic Blast from the Past, Kaz and Oliver play with the contents of an old box of junk and accidentally use a wormhole transporter to rip a hole into the 1950s, pulling the hero Captain Atomic into the present. Captain Atomic is from the 1950s. But who are all these broads dressed as doctors? <laughs> Those are doctors. <laughs> Girl doctors? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Right, lizard doctor? <laughs> I had this terrible dream where women were doctors and men didn't wear hats. <laughs> Oh, it was real. While he was basically the tecton of his time, he's pretty archaic and obsolete compared to everyone in the present. But every superhero in town is getting taken out by the dangerous Black Falcon. Oliver tries to boost Captain Atomic's spirits by insisting that he's still just as powerful as anyone else here. This prompts him to go and battle the Black Falcon himself, where he quickly learns that he isn't. With his atomic battery damaged, Oliver and Kaz are told by Horus to time travel back to the 1950s Mighty Men and find a replacement. Kaz! We did it! We're in the 1950s! Alright, we need to find the atomic batteries. I'll map out a plan. This pill bottle will be you, this tongue depressor will be me, and this atomic battery will be the door. <laughs> What are you doing? Now we don't know where the door is! While in the 50s, they discover that Horus is immortal, and they cause his love of bridges to happen in the first place. There's nothing I hate more than intruders. And I hate to hate things. But I love to love things! <laughs> That's right, you love bridges! Bridges? Sturdy, functional, stylish? Not a bad idea. I love bridges! Excuse me a second. It's the villain Red Scare! Well done! Now read him his rights! Give him a fair trial at... <laughs> Not just joking. Pull his arms off! Communism! They're able to find the battery and escape, restoring Captain Atomic to full power and restoring his confidence. Meanwhile, Gus is casting a Skylar Storm movie that he'll direct himself. Gus thinks that Skylar's performance is severely lacking. Honestly, based. The role of Skylar Storm goes to... STEPHANIE! <laughs> what? How can you not pick 
like me. I was born to play this role. Literally, in a pot of nutrient solution. He casts Stephanie as Skylar instead. Gus films it vertically. This is a movie, man. And that was filmed right here behind us. It's at LA Center Studios off of West 5th Street. There it is. That's depressing looking. As this YouTube comment correctly pointed out. Thanks, commenter. I had this idealized dream of us like renting the set and me going there, but I cannot afford this, and so we're just gonna stand outside the gate on the street. Special shout out to the hero who carved the word sperm into every single fence post. Yeah, so like right there, basically um, behind the pink dumpster, we get a better vantage point. Certainly appears to be where they filmed it. You can see the, the gray rectangles are the same. Back in 2013, filming things vertically was just starting to become acceptable because of this app called Vine. Oh no! It's like four against one. <laughs> what am I gonna, like, do? <laughs> Stop it! You're destroying Skylar Storm's legacy. She would never fight in high heels. Faster. Suddenly, the Black Falcon arrives to battle Skylar Storm, the last hero in the city he hasn't beaten yet. No one explains to him that this is a film set. He doesn't notice that this looks nothing like Skylar Storm. He simply attacks, knocking out Stephanie. Connie steps in to intervene, and so does the newly revived Captain Atomic. Hey, bird brain. I don't mean to ruffle your feathers, but it's time to cock a doodle do. You in. <laughs> Black Falcon is defeated, and the day is saved. I don't understand how the superhero slash supervillain world stays a secret when this is happening in public. That's America's ass. But anyway, this was the greatest episode of any television show in history. Things have changed so much for the better. Yeah, like, like equal rights and opportunities for all, regardless of race or gender. Yeah, that. <laughs> Another interesting thing about this episode is that Gus gets upgraded in the credits to also starring, essentially putting him on the same level as Horus. He appears quite a bit more from here on out, definitely putting him a level above Jordan, but the change doesn't feel all that noticeable at the end of the day. Come season two, Gus will be fully upgraded to main cast, appearing in the same number of episodes as Alan and having a spot in the theme song, but he's still just treated as a side character, and it once again really isn't that noticeable that he's in more episodes than he was before, because his role is always very small. Now, back to season one. In Growing Pains, Brain Matter has been revived and cured, now with the power to manipulate the age of those around him. Unfortunately, he doesn't quite have control of his powers, and he reverts Owl Girl's sidekick into an egg, and reverts Kaz's caterpillars for his science project into eggs as well. What are we gonna do? I don't know about you, but I'm skidding the heck out of here. <laughs> when Oliver wakes up as a child the next day, Kaz and Brain Matter have to reverse Oliver's aging, which in turn causes him to age rapidly, and then they have to slow his aging down before he dies. Meanwhile, Alan enlists Skylar to help him hide his new power from Horus, the ability to shapeshift into animals. This episode introduces Brian, an employee at the Domain who works there while Wallace and Clyde are gone, and he acts almost exactly like them, and I genuinely wonder if they had originally intended for them to be here, but maybe decided it wasn't worth paying the actors for just these two scenes, or maybe they had an availability issue and just rewrote the part to be for this guy. He shows up in the very next episode, hanging out with Wallace and Clyde, and then never again, and he's really the only character in this entire show that feels out of place and without purpose. This episode also introduces my favorite irrelevant side character, Philip. If you're trying to replace the batteries, you're using the wrong tool. You need a teeny tiny Philip's head. Don't make fun of Philip's head. He's very self-conscious about it. It's not nearly as big as he wishes it were. Hey, <laughs> Philip, head's looking huge. You're just saying that. And in that aforementioned next episode, Night of the Living Nightmare, Oliver and Kaz are assigned a night shift. Neocortex returns to the hospital because his powers aren't working. Anyone he tries to read the mind of falls into a deep trance. Kaz is able to use Mighty Med's new mind reading helmets as a workaround to Neocortex's condition. head. 
When Neocortex has a freak psychic burst and everyone in the hospital falls into a trance, the kids realize that the source of the issue is a freak solar eclipse, and everyone who falls asleep from the trance will have a terrible nightmare. And if they die inside the nightmare, they die in real life. Now they have to desperately keep everyone in the hospital from falling asleep. Oliver and Kaz have to convince Oliver's mom that Oliver is staying at Kaz's place to keep Mighty Med a secret. So they lay out a fake bed in the hospital and stage a FaceTime call. I can't talk right now, Kaz is sleeping. <laughs> See? <sighs> Good night. Alright, she bought it. Kaz, stop fooling around, come on. With Kaz asleep, Oliver has to jump into Kaz's nightmares to help him out, where he's battling an overpowered megahertz. Kaz has to take control of his subconscious to defeat Megahertz. You ticked off the wrong half-human, half-cyborg substitute teacher! <laughs> You're on your own. You're right. I have to rely on myself. In the B-plot, meanwhile, Connie Valentine, Skyler, really wants Jordan to like her. Oh, is that Jordan? Hi, Jordan. Ooh, is that Connie? So she joins Jordan in playing a nerd game at the Domain with Wallace and Clyde. They challenge each other to a duel, but kill each other in the game. Then they make the conscious, verbal decision to be friends. Which is, of course, how friendships naturally form, with a verbal agreement. In Mighty Mad, Logan High School is infected by negativity and anger, and Kaz suspects that the supervillain Dr. Wrath might be somewhere loose in the school, because that's what Dr. Wrath does, he makes people angry. Kaz starts to suspect his gym teacher, Mr. Patterson, because he saw him walk through a wall. I choose to believe that Kirby from Sweet Life on Deck could also walk through walls. <laughs> I captured... Agent Blaylock of Superhero Secret Service Division? What? I didn't know they had a Secret Service Division. That's because it's a secret. <laughs> Super banger secret agent, seeing as he walked through a wall in front of students. Kaz wonders who Dr. Wrath is, and the biggest plot twist in the entire show happens. If you're not Dr. Wrath, then who is? Okay. Stephanie is casually Dr. Rath. She captures Kaz and Skylar, who have to say nice and positive things about each other in order to escape her negative trap. The show explains the pseudoscientific concept of positive and negative ions. The reactor's producing positive ions! Which gets stolen verbatim by Milo Murphy's Law several years later. Hey Stephanie, or should I say Dr. Rath? You should. That's my name. Anyways, Stephanie explodes. And then the biggest, most depressing letdown of all time happens. What's like going on? It's the real Stephanie. Dr. Rath hit her in the closet and shapeshifted into her form. Are you okay? How long were you in there? I like don't remember. Okay. <laughs> If any show were to randomly reveal the side character as a massive threat, it'd be Mighty Med, and I'm very disappointed that they didn't commit. But whatever. Meanwhile, Oliver tries to make Alan taste normal food, and Alan refuses. This happens over and over. That's the B-plot. Are you crazy? In Fantasy League of Heroes, Kaz is tired of losing at fantasy football and has the idea to create a fantasy hero league, where he'd be almost guaranteed to win due to his vast comic book knowledge. Thank you, Captain Atomic. When you stopped Sonic Shriek from destroying the Eiffel Tower, my team got points for villains thwarted and structure saved. Now I'm in first place, just a tiny bit ahead 
a Philip. <laughs> Skyler thinks it's a terrible idea and is also jealous because no one picked her. I'm putting all the lamest superheroes on your team. Oh no, it's the icicle. He flew too close to the sun. <laughs> Ooh, I think we found your next pick. <laughs> when Kaz trades Tekton for Captain Atomic, causing the two of them to squabble over who's the best superhero. A runaway fairy causes every single superhero to set out to save it, desperate to earn points, which leaves a bridge in danger of being destroyed by the supervillain Sonic Shriek abandoned. Kaz and Skyler have to go stop it. Tekton and Captain Atomic arrive, but once again they battle each other rather than Sonic Shriek, leaving Kaz and Skyler to disable the bomb that's about to destroy the bridge. In the end, Kaz is spared from an I told you so when the bridge incident catapults Skylar to the number one ranked hero, and causes Kaz to lose the Fantasy Hero League in the process. Alan, after learning about football like 20 minutes ago, now decides that he knows more about football than anyone, which Oliver scoffs at. Oliver challenges Alan to a football trivia contest. Oliver's partner is Horace. Alan's partner turns out to be famous sport person Adrian Peterson. That's Adrian Peterson. Yep. The six-time All-Pro running back for the Vikings. What? Then Allen destroys all the competition. What player holds the record for most touchdown passes in a single season? AJ Peterson. <laughs> I'm sorry, the correct answer is Peyton Manning. Like that's a real name. And wins the trivia contest. <laughs> Who led the NFL in rushing yards in the 2012 season? <laughs> I did. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, the correct answer is Adrian Peterson. I think the main takeaway from this episode is that none of the superheroes here are anywhere near as heroic as the Mighty Med Wiki user Magnesium7. In the time I've been researching for this video, they have been refining every single article on that wiki for months on end. If you look at history on just about every page, you'll see Magnesium 7 right at the top having made several edits. They deserve all the praise and attention in the world. Thank you for your service, Magnesium 7. The Mighty Med fandom would be in shambles without your contributions. In copycaz, Wallace and Clyde actually take steps to taking over Mighty Med. Remember that? Remember that when that was their plan? Clyde uses an optical image replicator to impersonate the shape of Kaz and sneak into the hospital. So Clyde is actually this episode's protagonist, except he's played by Bradley Stephen Barry the entire time. He follows Kaz inside. It was that simple. They just followed Kaz. It took them 19 episodes to have this idea. Once inside, Clyde attempts to steal half of the mysterious Dyad of Nebulon. He's caught by guards and is deemed a fugitive. Take him away and turn him into a cube! A cube? What, what are you talking about? You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. A cube is a three-dimensional solid polyhedron with six square faces of equal sizes, you traitor! Ultimately having his memory of the whole experience erased and getting thrown out. My favorite trope in shows is the, ooh, we want to have another episode to continue the storyline, but we aren't ready for the storyline to actually progress, so we'll just tread our wheels and undo the plot development by the end, only for it to happen again later, but we'll explain slightly more of the lore at the end of the episode to make it worth it. I promise that's a thing. That happens, man. <laughs> No one has any use for the Dyad of Nebulon other than Catastrophe, the most powerful villain ever to terrorize the galaxy. But he was defeated years ago and split into two separate beings, each of them pathetic and nearly powerless. The two beings must still be alive somewhere. Wait, a, a villain's impersonating me? Villains know who I am? That is awesome! So we finally learn who Wallace and Clyde are two halves of one supervillain named Catastrophe. Although I think I already said that at the beginning of this video, so oh well. And then they never have the idea to just follow Kaz again, despite the fact that Wallace's memories weren't wiped. In the B-plot, Alan asks Skylar for a ton of relationship advice, and she begins to fear that he has feelings for her. Hey Oliver, do you have a sec? I need to talk to you about something. Uh. But she's wrong, and he just has feelings for an octopus. We also learned that Alan single-handedly caused a global sweater vest shortage. The end. In Guitar Superhero, Kaz and Oliver attend a concert. Oh my god, it's Debbie Ryan! She's in Mighty Med! 
When a freak electrical accident causes pop singer Jade to gain superpowers, Oliver and Kaz bring her to Mighty Med to show her the superhero world. How are superheroes still a secret? She levitated in front of a crowd! When Jade, now calling herself Remix, is incredibly self-centered and stuck up, Skylar doesn't accept her as a hero. Anyway, I'm a superhero now. Sorry, but being a superhero is about bravery and self-sacrifice. Just because you have superpowers, it doesn't make you a superhero. Yeah, just like how being totally talented at playing guitar doesn't make you a great guitarist. Oh wait, it does. And decides to teach her a lesson by having Titanio dress up as the villain Soul Slayer and pretend to attack her, teaching her a valuable lesson about responsibility. But predictably, this turns out to be the real Soul Slayer, because Titanio was late. Titanio was the mech suit one from earlier, in case you forgot. I'll always keep you in the loop, don't worry. Debbie Ryan uses her powers to step up, save Skylar, and save the day. And then we have the most irrelevant B story of all time. Jordan hates that a frog's being dissected for a science lab, and so she and Gus sneak into the school at night to rescue it. Then the next morning... He did it! It was all Gus! <laughs> he even wrote this ransom note! Well, it is written in the same handwriting as... Gus's last test paper. <laughs> now that we know who was responsible, we can congratulate you. What? what? Well, I assumed whoever took the frog was trying to rescue it. So I reported the story to the local animal rights organization, and they convinced the school board to do away with dissections. And they want to give you a thousand dollar reward. <laughs> Miss Gleason, I have to confess, I was the one behind the whole thing. Tell her, Gus. Tell her! <laughs> Miss Gleason, the truth is, it was all my idea. Jordan had nothing to do with it. In fact, I don't even know who Jordan is. This story is not important. Did you know I was the first person to ever clap like this? <laughs> I can't possibly be- that is amazing! In the end, everyone is happy, and they have an epic rock concert, and live happily ever after. You won't keep me down, you won't let me fly free, I'm Olivia Rodrigo? In free Wi-Fi, Kaz hasn't done his homework, and decides to copy all of hers onto a flash drive. Not realizing that the flash drive is a prison for a supervillain named Wi-Fi! who's unleashed onto the hospital and sets out to destroy the hospital's every file. Kaz is trapped in a computer. Titanio's mech suits taken over by Wi-Fi's virus, etc. Wacky hijinks with Kaz, Oliver, and Benny. The B-plot is actually considerably more important, not only to the episode, but to the duration of the series. Alan desperately wants to meet his father, the superhero Optimo. However, Horus insists that Optimo is too important, and if Alan were to be seen with him, it could put him in danger, in the crosshairs of Optimo's enemies. But Alan isn't satisfied with this anymore, and Skylar agrees to help him find his dad, who turns out to simply be a man named Nelson, who doesn't seem to recognize Alan, and shows no signs of having powers whatsoever. I just wanted to meet you. I've heard so many stories. All the incredible saving you've done. It's true. I never met a coupon I didn't like. <laughs> That's why I have so many cans of cat food. <laughs> I don't even have a cat. I think your father is a normal. What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. My Uncle Horace told me my dad is Optimo, the superhero. Why would he lie? Maybe he didn't want you to find out that your father is really just Nelson. Alan refuses to accept the fact that his dad's in Normo, and tries to trigger his dad's powers, but can't. Horus arrives and explains the truth. Your father's really in Normo. No, he isn't. There's no way. He's Optimo. Optimo doesn't exist. I made up that story so you wouldn't be disappointed. You see, years ago, my sister, your mother, married Nelson. It was a lovely wedding. They had a make-your-own ice cream sundae bar. <laughs> anyway, right before you were born, the villain Razor Claw captured your father and tried to use him to get into Mighty Med. We rescued your father, but we realized it wasn't safe for him to know about the superhero world. For his protection, we had to erase his memory. An emotional Alan leaves, grappling with the fact that his dad isn't special, he's just a regular man. Bye.
like bitches. It is Optimo. Okay, Optimo. Oh, he's real. I hate that I can't tell Alan my true identity and have a relationship with him. I know it's hard, but this is the way it has to be. Razorclaw has vowed revenge. I suppose you're right, Horace. Still, I'm glad I finally got to meet my son. He seems like a fine young gentleman. Eh. Two writers makes a wrong finally does what all Mighty Med fans had been begging for since the beginning. It thoroughly explains the socio-economic conditions of the hospital in detail. You see, all the comic books are based on actual events. The omnipotent being Ambrose writes and draws the comics as they happen in real time. Then, they're stocked on comic book shelves, and comic book sales are what fund the entire hospital. However, sales have been steadily declining lately, leading to budget cuts and tighter funding at Mighty Med. This show has such a fully realized premise and world, and it's so endearing to me. Kaz and Oliver suggest that making the comics more exciting than they've been lately might increase sales, and Ambrose takes their advice. The Crusher is arguing with his mother-in-law. Yeah, this is a perfect start. But how about we change arguing to battling? <laughs> oh, oh, and replace mother-in-law with reptilian death beast. When the superhero Dark Warrior is defeated by his rival Dreadlock in a humiliating manner, Kaz and Oliver change the ending of the comic so that he won. However, a furious Dreadlock challenges Dark Warrior to a rematch. With Dark Warrior still too injured to fight him, Oliver has to go in his place to battle Dreadlock. Awesome! With Kaz on the sideline giving him advice. That's when both parties learn the truth. You're not Dark Warrior! You're just a kid! You're not Dreadlock! Fine. I'm not the evil Dreadlock. I'm just his assistant, Bob. <laughs> Dreadlock came down with a stomach virus, so he made me come in his place. This has the same energy as when Larry and the Peach stare at each other in that one VeggieTales song. Awkwardly returning home, everyone learns a lesson, I guess. In the B-plot, Alan decides to embrace his normal roots just one episode later. He has an intense normo off with Skylar to see who's more of a normo. It's a 100 meter buffet. <laughs> or as Normos put it, a light snack before dinner. Here he comes with two plates! And he's taking way too many napkins! Judges! Crusher, 10. Solar Flare, 10. Incognito, 10. The score is now tied. So I prepared a super secret tie-breaking event. Can care less about others and not help this innocent lizard bystander. I can't just stand by here and do nothing. Alan is the winner! In Are You Afraid of the Shark, Oliver and Skylar are tasked with pet sitting Horace's pet dog while he's away with a meeting with his higher up and ex, the administrator Dr. Bridges. There's one thing Horace forgot to mention. I want to introduce you to my pet dog now. Why do you keep your dog in the Aquatic Research Center? I don't have a pet dog. I have a pet name dog. <laughs> He's a shark. Dog the Shark shows extreme aggression towards Oliver, who fearfully decides to feed it more treats than allotted. Naturally, the shark evolves into a man shark and starts eating the patients at the hospital. Oliver and Skylar have to get it under control before Dr. Bridges and Horace return. At the end, it evolves all the way into a man. The show already felt like Phineas and Ferb. Now it is doubling down. What the heavens? I don't like you. <laughs> I hate Bridges! Meanwhile, the domain is failing financially. We're going out of business. But the domain is our link to Kaz and Oliver, and they're our link to Mighty Men. So we gotta figure out how to stop losing money hand over fist. Hand over fist, what does that mean? I don't know. Put out your hand. Still no clue. Gus has his dad simply buy the domain and grant it to him. 
When Gus decides to convert the domain into a Chinese restaurant, Kaz brings in a health inspector to shut it down and get Wallace and Clyde back in control. Wallace, we got a big problem. I'm sorry, but whenever I climb down from the top bunk, I'm gonna step on your pillow. I've nowhere else to land. Once again, I struggle to believe that they're not a part of the LGBTQ plus community, or as I've now been told, the LGBTQAA plus community. Although I was under the impression that the plus would kind of account for all additional additions like that. Technically, couldn't the plus just account for all the letters in here? Even more technically, I would think the Q could just stand for all the letters in here because queer is an umbrella term for all of these individual terms. LGTBQ and queer are just synonyms, so why is queer part of the acronym LGTBQ+. Like, either have LGTB+, or just Q+, to be twice as inclusive, or just L+, rather than LGTBQ+, which sounds like the newest streaming service. So I have just offered a ton of great new name ideas to the Legitipaqua Plus organization, balls in their court. And now, in the final episode before the finale, the pen is mighty meddier than the sword, Horus Kier is a superhero called the Valkyra with the Pandorian, a powerful pen that will bring whatever it draws into real life. Kaz steals it and has fun drawing with it, but eventually learns that whatever it draws disappears after six hours, and Horus desperately needs it again to keep Valkyra alive. Kaz has, naturally, lost the box. He left it at school somewhere and Gus found it, and now Kaz has to battle a bizarre monster drawn by Gus to get the box back. Meanwhile, Skylar is annoyed that Oliver's managed to cure every single hero in the hospital except for her, calling back to his promise at the beginning of the season. That would be great. After he's unable to make progress, he decides to simply lie and say he fixed her powers. And Skylar spends the entire day thinking she is invisible, even though she isn't. Skylar eventually finds out he lied. Naturally. No shit. And he apologizes. They make up. They're happy at the end. Valkyra? She's fine, what happened? Well, I cured her an hour ago. Oh, I found the Pandorian. It was in my pocket the whole time. <laughs> but I still can't find the backup pen. And here it is, the two-part season one finale of Mighty Med. On the Mighty Med season finale, there's a storm coming. Skylar Storm. Skylar Storm takes on. <laughs> to reclaim her stolen superpowers. Can the boys stop a deadly infestation of villains and save Mighty Med and their friends? You open the pod starter reactor? What's in it for me? I don't know. Staying alive? Or does Skylar Storm face an even darker destiny? The Mighty Med season finale is coming. Catch the brand new one hour special Monday, September 15th on Disney XD. When the kids decide to throw a one year anniversary party for their time together at the hospital, the stakes become dire. I accelerated the timeline on the simulation and discovered that not only will Skylar lose her powers forever, but on Tuesday her limbs will explode and she'll die. With Skylar's power loss about to be permanent, and her about to explode, Oliver finally decides that the time to get her powers back is now. Unfortunately, the only way to do that is to steal them from the Annihilator himself. So, they travel down beneath Mighty Med to the super prison known as Mighty Max and interrogate Experion who physically gives them his eyeball, which has the retina clearance necessary to access Annihilator's lair. Once inside, they manage to grab Skylar's powers, but then he arrives. As this happens, Wallace and Clyde discover Alan's comic about Mighty Med and tell Gus to find him and bring him to the domain. There, they interrogate him, and when that doesn't work, they opt to manipulate him, telling him that he can get revenge on his Uncle Horus if he brings them the other half of the dyad of Nebulon. And Alan, being a sneaky, conniving little loser, does so. I will never, ever be betrayed again! Um, slight change of plan. <laughs> wow. Bring them what they need to achieve ultimate power. Something interesting about this finale is that a ton of the previously silent extras actually say lines. The reason that's interesting is because they continue appearing after this. Silent again. Let's think back to Lab Rats, when an old lady teacher appears in silence in the early seasons, says one line in season 2, and never appears again. This commenter explained that if she were to return, she'd have to specifically be written as that character's name, and they'd have to pay her union rates. But these extras are written as specific characters, and they're in like half the episodes of each season, 
and they continue to appear after having speaking roles. As you've probably noticed in this video, Mighty Med has about a hundred specific named characters throughout Season 1, whereas Lab Rats had about 20. That's it. Did Mighty Med have a higher budget than Lab Rats? Why were they able to use this many characters so frivolously, but Lab Rats wasn't? It's one of those things that I think about, and I just can't quite rationalize or explain. Now, part two of the finale starts. We finally meet the terrifying Annihilator, who speaks with that one voice David Sabalov does. Who should I finish off first? Barack Obama. It will almost be an honor to kill you. Kaz and Oliver narrowly escape and get back to Mighty Med, with Oliver planning to return Skylar her powers as a surprise during the party. However, at this moment, Wallace and Clyde combine and form the terrifying, unstoppable villain, Catastrophe. I am Catastrophe. I have returned from my revenge. Suddenly, Experion and Megahertz invade the hospital as well, having escaped from Mighty Max down below. Because the hospital has a really good security during the unimportant episodes, but really terrible security during the important episodes. Oliver decides to give Skylar her powers back. However, the Annihilator joins the fray and ambushes them as well, all while Horus fights for his life to survive the might of Catastrophe. This leads to my all-time favorite joke of the entire series. The axe is labeled, in case of catastrophe. They don't hang on this, they don't have Adam Davenport say, Hey! This guy's named Catastrophe and it says that on the axe too! It's just a one second visual gag, and it's the hardest I laughed at anything through all two seasons. I love shows that build up multiple plot lines across season one, and have all of them pay off in the season one finale at the same time. It's always very satisfying, and it's satisfying here. This finale is just battle after battle. None of them are good, not at all, but they try. Just as Horus is about to be finished off, Alan returns to Mighty Med, having been freed by Gus earlier. Alan tackles Catastrophe, the most powerful being in the universe, and steals the dyad from his neck. Again, Alan defeats the most powerful being in the universe. At this point, Alan is given a choice. Destroy the dyad! Throw it into the reactor! Don't listen to him! Alan. With this dyad, you'll be feared by men, loved by women, ignored by cats. Because you know how cats are. Eh, seems like too much work. <laughs> With the dyad destroyed, our attention turns to the Annihilator, who's finally captured by Skylar. Her power is beginning to return. Everyone makes up, and Skylar thanks Oliver for returning her powers to her. She finally kisses him on the cheek, and the show pretends that this is the first time it's ever happened, even though it isn't. Her powers return! The ability to fly and create portals are, once and for all, back. Amazing! I've never seen such a complete restoration of powers! But then there's an issue. Skylar's powers have been infected with EVIL! E-V-I-L! Skylar turns on all of Mighty Med and yet another incredible performance from Paris Burrell. You are not going to be running anything anymore. Now, with their best friends powered and evil, Kaz and Oliver are cornered. And this is actually the note that the season ends on. There's a storm coming. Skylar Storm. I love it! Mighty Man is so dumb, it's so limited, and yet there's so much passion and energy in absolutely everything. Okay, now I'm gonna go watch Survivor. I've been recording here for hour 15 minutes straight. I don't feel like this is right because y'all are coming at this well, as like we're obviously racist. Obviously, my name. No one not. ever said okay, that. But hold no on, one hold on. That. Yes, that's but what, obviously it was going to be me today, Listen, right? Guys, was it going to be nothing, me today? It doesn't mean that that's any has anything to no do with race, guys. This is the game. That. Let's talk about the sets in Mighty Med, because compared to Lab Rats, there are definitely multiple. The Mighty Med Hospital has multiple rooms, and I actually noticed that all of them are one massive interconnected set. The lobby of the Normo Hospital is a small little space, but it leads into the supply closet, which has the symbol of Caduceo, and leads into the reception room slash primary operating room of the Mighty Med Hospital. 
Back here is the opening to a hallway. This curves all the way around, and this door leads to the gym slash hangout room. So I believe that the floor plan looks like this. All the cameras live down here, and they can just slide around to whatever room the action is taking place in. And they use this hallway slope to constantly pretend like the hallway is bigger than it actually is. Opened. It's gotta be the door of doom. Stop being such a baby. <laughs> like all three of those took place right here. This set is cool. It looks great. It's really big. And it took me a long time to identify what room is for which and what connects to what because there's so much visual variety here with clear theming. There's a handful of other one off rooms in the hospital. There's operating room, a file room, etc. I don't I think these connect to the main set, they're probably just other sound stages outfitted with similar set dressing for one episode each as they appear. And there's more. Logan High School has this primary central hallway. The stairs go nowhere, once again, but there's a connected exterior courtyard on the front of the school and a classroom set that's accessed through this door. In its first appearance, the classroom has eight chairs, but then it gets a couple more. I guess the school district got a grant. The courtyard noticeably isn't present yet in the first four episodes. Instead, there's a generic green outside area. The courtyard doesn't show up until episode five. There's also a frequently recurring gym set. I am not smart enough to know if this is physically connected to the rest of the school or if it's just a disconnected set somewhere else. These doors might connect, I'm not sure, and since we don't see a clear connection, I would just guess it's disconnected. And finally, we've got the domain. The main comic book shop is, again, very spacious with a lot of different segments. Wallace and Clyde's register, the lounge, the comic stands, there's also an exterior of the building that shows up halfway through season one, built to resemble the cannery, because dragging Bradley Stephen Perry and the gang up to film scenes at a crowded marketplace in San Francisco really wouldn't work, so they built a look-alike. Those are the three main locations, and I already said this, but there's just so much to look at, so much visual variety not only between the three sets, but within each set. Counting all the separate rooms, there's basically 10 areas that this show can shoot its scenes in. Compare this to the first three seasons of Lab Rats, which had house, school, lab, comparatively tiny sets, toggled between with little else, there were almost no other recurring locations there. There's two episodes where they have to go to Principal Perry's office, and it's a different office each time because they probably tore the first one down already to make space. That's a whole section I cut from the Lab Rats video for time, because I didn't want to make that video any longer than necessary. Even when Lab Rats was at its peak in popularity and budget, the Bionic Island had command room, training room, Lab Rats room, sometimes a weapons room. Someone even pointed out in a comment that the cafeteria set for Bionic Island is literally just the training room with wall paneling rolled in. And I've just gotta wonder, like, between this and all of the acting union stuff we talked about before, did Mighty Med just have seven times, 10 times, 20 times the budget of Lab Rats? Or were the Lab Rats producers just terrible at spending their money? And now I would like to take an entire moment to break down the humor of this show, because there is so much to talk about. The show had no right being trapped on the Disney XD channel. First off, every single episode title is a pun or a form of wordplay. Guitar Superhero, Copy Kaz, Smolliver's Travels. Remember that episode where Kaz frees the supervillain Wi-Fi? The episode is named Free Wi-Fi, and this extends into the episodes too. There's endless medical puns and superhero puns. Relentless. At least one per scene. Okay, Grey Granite, let's check your reflexes. Reflex time, a little slow. What's up, Keith? <laughs> Looking sharp. I have to go remove one of two-headed man's heads. From now on, he's just gonna be... man. You can be the one true rock superhero. 
<laughs> she really bounced back quickly. It helps that she's made of rubber. Achoo! Was that a sneeze? No. She just said, Achoo! Impressed by Alan's miracle cure? Also a handful of running gags within each individual episode. Kaploof? What even makes that sound? Oh, so that's what Kaploof sounds like. Jerome from accounting is stealing pencils. Don't even look at me! Not you two, I was talking to Kaz! In the meantime, I'll take care of Jerome in accounting. <laughs> ah, we left Jerome from accounting in here. Teach you to steal pencils, so you have to go in the cubing chamber. Not you, Marcel! Kaz! Most of the jokes are also just stupid nonsense that don't make any sense whatsoever. Complete Monty Python nonsense. But they're still just, <laughs> they're just funny, and I don't know why. You'll behold miraculous wonders so secret that if I try to tell you, this happens. You're wasting your time staring all day at that vision board. Well, that's not true. It's helped me achieve my first life goal, to stare all day at a vision board. Let's just say Dr. Glowhead wasn't born that way. <laughs> hey, I was just talking about you. <laughs> Why do you have a phone? You've been on this planet for like a week. You don't know anybody. That's why I got the no friends and no family plan. <laughs> because I love secrets. <laughs> for example, Lizard Man still doesn't know that I kicked him off the bowling team. Oh, Lizard Man! Bowling's rained out again. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but the veterinary wing of Mighty Med is down the hall and to the... <laughs> don't get too close. He bites. <laughs> Some episodes will just repeat jokes from previous episodes, and it really only works if you remember the joke from the previous time. I don't know what this button does. I wonder what this button does. Commemorative, I cast this up fake photo. Commemorative, I Oliver this up fake photo. Okay, The Adventures of Tecton, issue one, copyright 1970. Oh my gosh, slip ahead! Everything you know about Neocortex, starting with this very first comic book. Okay, uh, Neocortex Comics, issue one, copyright 1983. Oh my gosh, flip ahead! <laughs> Check it out, I'm a rooster. <laughs> Check it out, I'm a turkey. Check me out, I'm a rooster! It has the same energy as when Phineas and Ferb season three introduced a bunch of running gags, and then the show completely forgot about every single one of them by season four. My watermelon! My watermelon! My watermelon! Sir. My watermelon! Let's just examine one scene from the season one finale that I think serves as a great microcosm of how the show's humor works. Let's watch it individually, and then we'll have the class come back together to discuss it. Skylar, how are things going? Have you been feeling a tad explodey lately? No, why do you ask? Oh, just making chit chat. <laughs> By the way, I ordered balloons for Alan's surprise party. Alan hates balloons. He hates all things that pop. Balloons, corn, weasels. Fine, I wanted them. I love balloons. Is that a crime? If so, lock me up in balloon jail. I'd love it there. Look. I know what's best for Alan, and that includes keeping this a secret. He cannot know anything about this. So it's true? You are keeping secrets from me! <laughs> False alarm, just balloons! So, Skyler is about to explode, and Horace asks her if she feels explodey lately, which he claims is just casual chit-chat, which is just stupid nonsense. A cleanup squad immediately runs in to prepare if Skylar needs to be cleaned up, which is just stupid dark humor. Then we learn that Horace is ordering balloons for himself because he loves balloons, continuing the I Love Bridges running gag. Alan overhears, he gets upset, and he leaves in an over-exaggerated Alan way. And you'll pay dearly for this! Dearly! I treated the worker fine, thank you very much. I stand by exactly what I said. Don't tell I was being disrespectful. I was not. 
being disrespectful. Giving this scene an actual sense of progression, that being a character situation is not the same at the beginning of the scene as it was at the end. Alan destroys the balloons, which serves as a punchline for Horace ordering them, and then the cleanup squad mistakes that for Skyler exploding and they run in, serving as a second punchline mere seconds later to the original setup. All of that within the span of a minute! Every episode is like this. Every scene has its own punchlines built up across the scene, carries over jokes from the episode as a whole and the show as a whole, while moving the story along within each individual scene. All of the humor comes from the characters' personalities and performances. This show is a just- it's a masterpiece of comedic efficiency. Are all of them hysterical jokes? No. No. Oh god no, they're not. I farted? But this show's pace is so relentless that it doesn't matter. It's nine o'clock. This party is a total bomb. Guys, it's just an expression. Nobody's gonna blow up. At least not for three hours. <laughs> Midway through season one, I realized that I was getting very strong Phineas and Ferb vibes from Mighty Men. The humor of the show is very reminiscent of that PNF style, and the style of continuity, where the episodes start completely episodic and detached from each other, and then the writers just casually decide to build on elements of previous episodes that seem superfluous at the time. And that's when Jonathan, of the YouTube channel Second Dimension, pointed out that Jim Bernstein, one of the co-creators of Mighty Med, is Jim Bernstein, one of the main writers from Season 3 and 4 of Phineas and Ferb. And that blew my mind because I know exactly who Jim Bernstein is. I've interacted with him on Twitter before, but I didn't realize that Jim Bernstein was Jim Bernstein. Right there on his Twitter, his profile pictures parry the platypus, but it says right there, co-creator of Mighty Men. So that's why this show feels like Phineas and Ferb, and then all of the preceding Dan Povenmire media after it, is because one of the main guys on all of that stuff was one of the co-creators of Mighty Men, and you can feel it tangibly coming through the screen. The scripts in Lab Rats were generic as hell, it's just that some of the actors managed to deliver the boring lines very, very comedically. <sighs> Leo's gonna be so surprised. I'm gonna go tell him. <laughs> Adam. All right. Well, I'm going to go tell Leo he's not having a surprise party. <laughs> that was close. He almost found out. <laughs> Mighty Med, however, has absolutely brilliant scripts, just with terrible actors. Why am I even bothering physical therapy? I also discovered that the other guy, Andy Schwartz, was a writer on 56 episodes of Scrubs before jumping to Mighty Med. My last significant writer discovery was that one of the writers, Ian Weinreich, was simultaneously writing for Screen Junkies on his trailers whilst writing for Mighty Med from Joss Whedon, God of the Nerds. Under our old friend Andy Signore. Oh, no, no. So that's quite a double life. He also wrote for the Honest Trailer's failed parody show, Interns of Field, that no one watched, even at the height of Screen Junkies. And check out the first episode of our new original series, Interns of Field, to find out about superheroes assistance. Assistance. Come on guys, we worked really hard on it. We really appreciate you watching it. In Lab Rats, characters would constantly just stop appearing for no reason. Eddie was in every other episode, then just boom. Never again, past season 3 episode 7. Bree had a new boyfriend every season, and they were all gone by the next, with no explanation. <laughs> Luckily, in Mighty Med, this doesn't really happen. Granted, the show ran for less time, and by the end of Lab Rats season 2, there hadn't been any jarring disappearances either. All the major and recurring characters from season 1 of Mighty Med are still major and recurring characters by season 2 of Mighty Med, although some have significantly reduced their roles, those being Jordan, Wallace, and Clyde. But it doesn't feel unusual at all, it feels like a very natural progression. The Wallace and Clyde arc is pretty much done, they're in jail, it's gonna be harder to incorporate them into episodes. Meanwhile, the show is just focusing more on the superhero side of things rather than the school side of things. There was nothing that made me think like, yeah, that's weird, where'd they go? The only characters from season 1 who don't continue appearing in season 2 are Benny, the awkward nurse, the news reporter, which like, that's a trope, straight up. There's a ton of shows that have a news reporter show up in season 1, and then they just like stop appearing in later seasons. That happens a lot. And then like, I don't know, Brian Brian, Brain Matter, Miss Gleason? Experion never comes back, but like, who cares? That's it. And these are all just like, nothing side characters. I'd say, on average, shows have more characters than this disappear between seasons. 
So this is pretty good. That means there's no need for me to cut back and forth between between putting people on the board and taking people off the board. This board is set and is retired for the rest of the video. Check in to an all new season of Mighty Men. Ooh, Guinea. Ah, I should have seen that coming. This is all your fault! And watch the treatment get intensive. I had a brand muffin this morning. Things are about to get real up in here. I hate this power! Because in this hospital, heroes get healthy. I beg to differ! But the fight against evil is still totally sick. That's even better than what I had in mind. The new season of Mighty Men. Catch the one-hour season premiere next Monday night at 7 on Disney XD. The two-part season premiere, How the Mighty Med Has Fallen, picks up right where the season one finale left off, with an evil Skylar turning on Kaz and Oliver, who desperately attempt to appeal to her heart. I, I know deep down you don't want to do this. I mean, you and I are BFFs. We, we watch movies together. Uh, we help each other with our homework. I'm the one who showed you the real world, Chase. I taught you what it means to be a brother. Kaz and Oliver have a frivolous comic book disagreement, which will be important later. Like the superhero Rewind. Nuh-uh. Rewind can only travel five seconds into the past. Uh-huh. In issue 72, Rewind discovered that if his powers were amplified with electrical force, he could drive further back to whatever time he was thinking about. Nuh-uh. It was in issue 73, he said- Quiet. The Annihilator plans to access all of the superhero files from the hospital and learn all of their weaknesses. Horus uses his time freeze power. And he has a time freeze power, by the way. I don't think I've mentioned that, but he, he has that. Against Skylar, allowing Kaz and Oliver to escape. Although, the Annihilator drains Horus' powers in the process, and begins to interrogate Horus. Oliver and Kaz set out on what I can only describe as a series of irrelevant fetch quests to pad time. First, they try to launch themselves out of an escape pod to go fly to the League of Heroes and ask for help. Which, would that not be shooting out of the side of a public hospital? But whatever. Alan, unfortunately, smacks him with a trash can, and then takes the escape pod for himself to escape. Their backup plan is to contact the League of Heroes using a remote, but they don't know which remote it is, and so they just have to confusedly hit buttons on the remotes until they find the right one. The hospital will self-destruct in three. Turn it off! Uh, let me try this one. Okay, I'll push it again, maybe they'll all disappear. This one also does nothing. Kaz also finds a potato chip under the couch cushion and eats it. And by this point, I had seen enough Mighty Med. I knew, yeah, yeah, that's the quantum chip. Unfortunately, it's all for nothing. Skylar attacks them, and before long, they wake up in Mighty Max alongside Alan, who fell asleep in the escape pod and got captured as well. The three of them discuss how to defeat Skylar, and realize the only thing powerful enough to defeat her evil energy barrier is the Crystal of Crown. And Alan points out that he's seen it at the Domain. Realizing that Wallace and Clyde were real villains, they begin to question if the Crystal of Crown and all the relics in the store might be real as well. Oliver attempts to call Henry Tidwell slash Titanio to obtain it. But the call doesn't go through because Cass reveals he dropped Oliver's phone in the toilet yesterday and broke it. Back at the domain, Jordan and Gus see the empty store and decide to run it, but accidentally keep messing the store up, and they have to try to fix it before Wallace and Clyde get back. But since we the audience know that Wallace and Clyde won't be coming back, it's, it's just a really dull subplot. Also, Gus is a lot older now. And he's at the age where, like a lot of lab rat characters, and by the end of the show, he just comes across as too old to be acting the way that he does. And where's that kid, Alan? He left his rope. He loved that thing. He had it wrapped around himself like a big hug. <laughs> and just the actor aging in the months between filming seasons was enough to completely break and shatter this Gus slash Jordan dynamic. In the previous seasons, he felt like an annoying little brother to her. They may have been the same age, but that's certainly what it felt like in the show. Now, they feel like complete peers, but the scripts are still written with a little brother dynamic in mind. What happened to this painting? There was a leak. Well then, why didn't you do something? You told me to do nothing. You're welcome. <laughs> From this point on in the show, 
their natural banter no longer works, and it feels very, very awkward. It was extremely inconsiderate of Augie Isaac to age. He should have thought about the show before he made that decision. What character do you play? I play Gus. He's kind of a weird kid at school, and he does a lot of crazy things. Back at Mighty Men, Horace continues to endure interrogation from the Annihilator. So you... <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, sorry, I can see my reflection in your helmet. My hair is cuckoo! Then I'll just torture your beloved nephew instead. Zachary? Alan! I meant Alan! Oh, well, these things happen. Hey, is that someone over your shoulder you should turn around and look at? Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 it was a trick, a ruse, a gambit, a ploy. It's a linguistic scrambler. yik nap chur nak nabi wat shashum balon Don't look. What was that pill? Tell us! Uh -oh. Wait a minute. This isn't my mouth. I just injected myself with a lying serum. No matter what you ask me, I will not be able to tell you the truth. This is an anti-lying serum. Why did they write anti so small? I mean, that's a pretty important detail. For whatever reason, the show starts doing voiceover narration, where we just hear the characters' thoughts while they stay dormant. I forgot that my powers are weakened, and I can still move. If I can only reach this. It's very weird for a sitcom, and it was super unexpected and unusual to just suddenly start happening out of nowhere, but I actually think it works really well within the context of Mighty Med's comic book theme. And so throughout the rest of season two, we just randomly cut to characters' voiceover narration sometimes, and it's never acknowledged. Sort of feels out of place, but it also sort of works. Under Mighty Med, Kaz, Oliver, and Alan discover a tunnel dug by a previous prisoner. I'm not gonna question that. And they crawl inside, hoping the tunnel leads to an exit. Stop being such a chicken little. Oh, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. <laughs> they find themselves in a cell with megahertz, leading to part two. Also, back in season one, every single closing credit segment consisted of random clips getting repeated forwards and backwards. Here, though, the credits for season two consist of entirely still images. How embarrassing. Kaz, Oliver, and Alan have landed in a specialized cell that will permanently turn Megahertz into an action figure, and it's about to activate. In order to break the cell open and escape, Alan shapeshifts into a whale. Oh, come on already! <laughs> Megahertz, as thanks for saving his life, decides to spare the kids and restore power to Oliver's phone who calls Titanio and asks him to grab the Crystal of Crown from the Domain. Yes, Oliver! No, I'm sorry, I'm very busy right now. Well, if you must know, I am collecting empty bottles for the five cent deposit. This man's a billionaire who collects bottles, and I just, it's just so funny. It's like, they don't, they don't hang on that joke, they just move on. I respect that, and I, re I respect his grind. He's the only good billionaire. He goes to the Domain and purchases the Crystal from Gus. If you give me the Crystal, give you my very expensive sports car. Excuse me while I roll my eyes. <laughs> Back up in Mighty Med, Oliver and Alan look for the quantum chip to protect it from the Annihilator. Fine, it's in here. And so are they. Oh, Horace! Is, is that my nephew, Zachary? And it turns out I was right. He made it look like a potato chip to disguise it as something unimportant. But why make it taste like sour cream and onion? It's supposed to what? Honey mustard? Kaz and Oliver are then tied up, and Skylar prepares to rip them apart and pull out the broken halves of the quantum chip. Unfortunately, the League of Heroes arrives just in time, paged by Titanio. This leads to an epic final showdown. Skylar and Annihilator are surrounded, and just as they're about to be defeated with a blast from the Crystal of Crown, Megahertz arrives. I'm a good guy now! I helped Oliver and Kaz break out of Mighty Max! 
Unless you guys have a brilliant way out of this, then I'm totally on your side. I do have a brilliant way out of this. Zap this canister. I'm reversing time. Skylar reverses time, bringing her back to the moment where she regained her powers in the season 1 finale. Amazing! She then requests some time alone with the Annihilator. And remember, she is still evil, Skylar. You turn back time. Very clever. Now they have no idea I'm evil, so we can work together in secret to turn all the superheroes into villains. Good plan. So, the Annihilator agrees to be captured, and the whole two-parter we just watched didn't happen. We are completely back to square one, back to the end of last season. The only difference is that Skylar being evil is now a secret. I have such an empty feeling. They made their own season premiere non-canon in the last minute of the premiere. Like, what is this show? All of this is the dumbest, stupidest schlock, and it's, it's peak fiction in every conceivable way. I have a remote control that can find the chip. Up, oh, and I think it's this one. Let me push it again and maybe all the chips will disappear. <laughs> season 2 episode 3, Lair Lair, continues the events of the season 1 finale and doesn't reverse them. That's the worst carved pumpkin ever. Are you kidding? That's a perfectly accurate portrait. Dr. O'Lantern, let's go tend to snowstorm. <laughs> If I had one nickel for every Mighty Med Season Blank Episode 3 that was a Halloween episode, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird. Yeah, never mind. I don't care. PNG tubers have already beat this joke into the ground. If I had a nickel for every time Phoenix and Ferb had a musical clip show, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? If I had a nickel for every time the villain of a Phineas and Ferb film was a dictator, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? I guess it's just those two? Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Oliver and Kaz are fighting about Halloween or something? I don't care. But something I've neglected to mention is that they have the most petty arguments in like 50% of the episodes at this point, and it's like, man. How can you possibly think this is my fault? We wouldn't be in this situation if we hadn't discovered Mighty Men, which wouldn't have happened if you hadn't made me read comic books. Stop it! I don't want to go. Why is everything always about what you want? You know, I don't know why Stephanie's giving you all the credit. That dog would not have been choking to death if it wasn't for me. At my fifth birthday party, I wished for a pony, but you blew out my candle, so I never got my wish. Stop following me. Look, I'm not helping you. If you fail this test, it's your problem, not mine. You know, all the time I'm always thinking, what can I do for Kaz? What can I do to cheer him up? How can I dislodge his head from that banister? <laughs> When's the last time you did anything for me? If I had, I wouldn't have been hanging out with you at the comic book store. I would have been out riding my pony, which would have been a horse by now! At this point, they just need to find new friends. Because guys don't really argue, to the best of my knowledge. Teenage boys just kind of vibe with each other, and if they stop getting along with someone, they just kind of drift. Like, there's no arguing between the men, unless the men are lovers. So, Kaz and Oliver are having this toxic-ass friendship, and still staying by each other's side, honestly seems less realistic to me than the superhero stuff. The two of them are dispatched to reclaim all of the stolen superhero powers from the Annihilator's lair. Skylar, who's still working for the Annihilator, opens a portal and sends the boys into distant space. And for no reason whatsoever, they're inside a bubble. And they're like, oh! No, Skylar's powers must have glitched! The oxygen in the bubble is running out! But where the heck did the bubble come from? Anyways, I'm not gonna hang up on that. Wait! I've got it! Hamsters! What? Run like a hamster on a wheel! The boys have to put aside their differences and work together to dodge asteroids and reverse engineer Oliver's cell phone to somehow open a space portal and return home. When they're gone, Skylar heads to the Annihilator's lair and injects all of the superhero's powers with evil. And when Tekton becomes suspicious of her, 
she promptly incapacitates him and frames him when the boys return. What happened to Tecton? Uh, my Skylar sense told me something was wrong. I got here and found Tecton trying to steal all the powers. Anyway, I caught Tecton trying to inject himself with all these powers, and then he attacked me. I think he's evil and working with the Annihilator. They believe her in her Oscar-winning performance, and the evil-infected powers start being injected into the superheroes. In the C-plot, Alan goes to his first-ever normal Halloween party, and all of the adult superheroes want to come with him because Halloween's the only day they can fit in and blend in with society. So all of these adult superheroes are just hanging out with the high schoolers and no one finds it weird at the end. Did I do the right thing? Do the ends justify the means? I'm sorry, I stopped listening after you said asparagus. <laughs> I didn't say asparagus. You said it a week ago. I stopped listening to you a week ago. In episode 4, Mighty Mole, an injured neocortex has been attacked by two other heroes leading the Mighty Men staff to suspect a mole among them. And so the entire episode is dedicated to uncovering the mole's identity. And, you know, we know who it is, so this episode sort of drags in that regard. Kaz tries to prove that the mole is Alan, while Agent Blaylock becomes fully convinced that it's Oliver, after Skyler lays out evidence to frame him. And now it's like, oh! This is the sixth consecutive episode that's completely serialized, which is at odds with the previous 24 episodes that were frivolous and standalone. They're also taking these ones far more seriously as well, with fewer jokes and more dramatic music. It makes it feel like the executives saw all the Lab Rat storylines performing well, and then made the Mighty Med writers incorporate those into Mighty Med. That being said, it's still pretty fun. This episode is a sequence of the characters sussing each other out. Alan turns Kaz and Oliver into tortoises. Hurry! We have to get to Blaylock before Alan does. Run! Hey, slow down! Wait for me! Skylar has a ticking clock because she's being kicked out of the hospital since her powers now work, and she's no longer being treated. You need to do something to throw them off our scent. I love hallways! Someone's coming! Horace! Why, hello! <laughs> you look different. Were you wearing a top hat a minute ago? Um, no. Oh, huh, it's too bad. I was gonna ask to borrow it. I love top hats! My powers have started acting all wonky! Watch! Explode! Wonky, wonky, wonky. Finally, Blaylock discovers the truth and accuses Skylar of being the imposter. She threatens him and it traps him in stone, popping into a space portal to permanently escape. Oh my god, finally, I can make that. Like, Agent Blaylock is dead. Like, this is permanent. You'd think in the superhero world they'd have a means of unstonifying him, but, like, no. Skylar actually killed a man. Then the actor died four months later. Yeah, this could be a problem. Oh, that's right, you better run! In Season 2, Episode 5, The Claw Prank Redemption, Kaz and Oliver know that Skylar's evil, but no one else does, and they're keeping that a secret for now. Alan decides to start attending normal school after enjoying that Halloween party, and he's, he's cringe as hell. I'll bet I'll be the most popular kid here, if I can keep my temper somewhat in check. You'll never be able to keep your temper in check. I said someone in check! What time do students suddenly start breaking into song and dance for no apparent reason? <laughs> Alan, that doesn't happen in real high school. We're Logan High, we are the Lancers. Put down the book and join us dancers. Woo! Hey, wait up for me! When Skylar invites Oliver to a school dance, he begins to question if she's still evil, and he eagerly accepts the offer. If she's evil, then why didn't she just explode me on the spot instead of inviting me to the dance? Did somebody say dance? <laughs> K 
Kaz, however, is not convinced, and he decides to get more information from the other villains down in Mighty Max. Don't worry. I've already figured out a way in. Listen up, everyone! I'm the villain! Uh, no name! And I am here to destroy you all! There's no way I can be stopped! Stop. Okay, I give up. Why are you so shocked? I'm not shocked. He's brought downstairs and finds himself in a cell with Wallace and Clyde. Well, well, well. You look familiar. Yeah, do we know you from somewhere? Let's play villain geography. Where'd you go to camp? <laughs> so, what are you in for? Whatever would scare you the most, that's what I did! <laughs> you tore one of those do not remove tags off a mattress? <laughs> Ripped it right off! You monster! Please don't hurt us! Cass learns from Wallace and Clyde that the Annihilator's evil spell can only be broken by true love's kiss. And Cass lets Oliver know before Philip, now a prison guard, rips his phone away. And then that's when Wallace and Clyde remember... Hearing you repeat that whole true love's kiss thing out loud, I think we're misremembering something. Yeah, the Annihilator didn't say that. That was the plot of Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> The Annihilator said that he gave Skylar the ability to drain the life force out of people with her mouth. So if she kisses your friend, your friend will die. How do we confuse that with Sleeping Beauty? Philip, I need to make another phone call. Oh, I've heard that one before. It's true. We also needed to make another phone call. <laughs> it's me, Kaz. Oh, I've heard that one before. It's true, we also said that we were Kaz. Now at the dance, Oliver and Skylar are both tasked with kissing each other. Oliver falsely thinking his will save her, and Skylar correctly thinking hers will kill him. I know she's evil, but I don't want her to die. I love her. I know I'm evil, but I don't want him to die. I love him, uh, like a friend. I don't want there to be any confusion in case anyone here can read my mind. <laughs> In which case, I'm totally not evil. And this is the most contrived setup for this I've ever seen, but I don't hate it. Kaz is able to escape from his prison cell by appealing to Philip and calling his head huge. I know that somewhere inside that giant head of yours is a shred of common sense, so please, let me out. I have to get to Oliver. His life is at stake. You said all I needed to hear. That my head was giant. <laughs> Uh, we should probably go too. Yes, because we are also the real Kaz. Ah! Alan's caught in the middle of a prank war between Jordan and Gus. When Alan's caught in the midst of the prank war one too many times. What? He embarrassedly shapeshifts into a pig, which Jordan and Gus later mistake for him having stolen the school's mascot, which they find very cool. Alan is branded the king of pranks and immediately becomes popular. He doesn't deserve it. High school high jinx, cool friends, cool drinks. <laughs> That's really good. Alan, the screaming pig, interrupts the kiss, however. Skylar can't bring herself to kill Oliver, even in her evil state, and she flees. She returns to the Annihilator and lies telling him that she killed Oliver. Kaz reunites with Oliver and checks in with him. This one doesn't end on a cliffhanger to lead to the next one, but the next one more than makes up for it. The next episode is the most vague, loose excuse for a Christmas episode I've ever seen. It's called, Do You Want to Build a Lava Man? Released just after Frozen stopped being popular as part of the 2014 holiday block. The episode's title is the only thing that could be vaguely considered Christmas themed, and I think they just probably shoehorned that title on it because Mighty Mad didn't otherwise have a Christmas episode to show that year. Gaz and Oliver look through comics at the domain, searching for the Annihilator's weaknesses when they find his very first comic, which details him as having been mentored by Haypax the Elder as a child to be a hero, before betraying him and becoming a villain. Haypax is currently hiding on Skylar's home planet of Caldera, so the boys steal the wormhole transporter from Horus- Do not touch the wormhole transporter! Don't even open that drawer where I keep it! You two couldn't survive on Caldera without atmosphere regulator patches. Which I also forbid you to use! <laughs> and teleport to the planet, where absolutely everyone looks like Skylar. Excuse me. We are. Ah! It's only 3,000 degrees! <laughs> this is the coldest winter we've had in years. 
They run into Skylar's pet, Doring Bosch, who looks exactly like Gus, as was mentioned back in season one. My name is Kakai Rata Hee Ha Mwah! Floopy Pazoy. He leads. Okay, first off, I'm a her. Leads them to Haypax. In the B plot, Optimo is injured in battle and rushes to Mighty Med for treatment, so Horus has to hide him from Alan. However, it turns out that Optimo has a terrible rash and has about 10 minutes to live. And before we talk about that, how about we make some idle chit chat? So, you're gonna die. Unless Alan donates some super erythrocytes. Super erythrocytes. 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 Look, I don't. I don't wanna just. I don't. I'm tired, man. I'm not gonna. Super erythrocytes. Horace basically has to extract the blood from Alan without him noticing while hiding his father from him. During your last 10 minutes of life, you will receive the highest standard of care. Oh, Oliver and Kaz find Kapax the Elder, who looks exactly like Alan, played by the same actor. I'm, I'm assuming the writers just thought it'd be funny, and that's the, the sole reasoning for this. What are you staring at? You just look. Almost like this guy we know. He doesn't want to return to Earth, but he tells them he will only help them if they can find the box of Azimuth for him, which requires them to set out on a quest and fight the box's terrifying guardian, an elderly woman. We need to get past a little old lady. <laughs> I wonder if this actor's still alive. Like, how did they explain the context of what was happening to her? Ultimately, the Doring Bosch sacrifices itself to let Kaz and Oliver escape, allowing them to bring the box back to Haypax. One, two, three! Boys have done well. Azimuth used his box to protect this amulet that gives the possessor the incredible power to balance my coffee table. <laughs> oh, that's been bugging me for years. Half of this show is just a waste of time, man. The writers are just trolling the audience so hard. It's a really enjoyable troll. He agrees to accompany them back to Earth. However, as soon as he leaves the room to grab something, is that the only thing that's behind you? Ow. Season 2 Episode 7, Storm's End, picks up right here. Haypax reveals himself to the Annihilator, and the two of them engage in an epic battle with high production value. Oliver, of all people, manages to gain an upper hand and threaten to kill the Annihilator, only for Skylar to betray the Annihilator and kill him first. You killed him! I knew you weren't evil. Oh, I'm still evil. I was just sick of that guy. And why set up for destroying Earth when I'm powerful enough to rule the entire universe? Skylar's pet Doring Bash apparently survived and it leaps onto her, very excited to see her again, allowing Kaz, Oliver, and Haypax to escape. Meanwhile, the evil superheroes initiate their plan, which is to weaken Horus by draining his powers with the Mirror of Zalcanicus, which is being sold at the Domain, of course, naturally. Tekton, under the guise of his alter ego, shows up to the Domain. Jordan thinks she recognizes him as Tekton from the comics and becomes determined to prove that he's a superhero, injuring him, doing all that wacky stuff. Alone in the Wasteland, Oliver and Kaz discuss if Skylar can ever be redeemed. No, we, we can't quit on Skylar. We have to save her. Why are you so obsessed with saving her? How about saving me? Well, maybe she's more worth saving than you are. Really? Which one of us has tried to destroy you about 12 times in the last week? Me or Skylar? Oh, I can't remember. I know you have this fantasy about Skylar falling in love with you, but I've got some news for you, pal. It's never going to happen. Well, I've got some news for you, pal. Shut your face. <laughs> She catches up to them, but they're able to weaken her, and Haypax drains Skylar of her powers, reverting her back to normal. 
that's when the Annihilator re-reveals himself. We've had two death fakeouts, shooting Skylar in the back and poisoning her. Hapax kills the Annihilator in return. The wiki says his death is ambiguous, but like... Good luck surviving this Annihilator. A massive blast shoots out across the galaxy, restoring all of the corrupted superheroes to normal. With Skylar dying, Hapax brings everyone back to Mighty Med. Although the doctors try desperately to save Skylar, She's flatlining! Do something! I need the defibrillator! She ultimately passes away due to her injuries. That's when Horace reveals his true identity. Stand back. Anatoly Mios! Mioi Thanatos! is Caduceo, the healer. The symbol of Caduceo in the supply closet subtly foreshadowing that from the beginning. He uses his limited resurrection powers to save Skylar. Three death fakeouts in one episode. That's a record. When I use my powers, they have a terrible, irreversible effect on me. I gain a pound right in my hips. <laughs> I only have the power to restore life five times. I only have one left. Also, Caduceo, to me, that's a really cool concept, and you just aren't going to see much done with that in a Disney Channel original sitcom. If you're a mortal, and you have the power to bring only five people back to life, how do you decide? What gives you the authority to decide? You'd have people coming after you, begging you to bring back loved ones, you probably have loved ones, thousands of people die every day, every minute, and you'd have the ability to revive only five throughout your life? Like, what do you do with that power? That's the cool, that's cool, man, like, but nah, uh, like, I love Mighty Med, but that concept was wasted on this show, because Mighty Med's not gonna get that dark, and nor do I think it should. It, 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 it has a, it, it has a, uh, wonderful tone, as is. So everything's back to normal. Skylar's no longer evil, but no longer has powers once again. The Annihilator's been defeated, and Hapax returns to Caldera. The status quo is basically completely reset to what it was before the season one finale. So, so <laughs> even though all of that is technically keystone, important episodes, they're not important because, <laughs> because, because the show's in the exact same position it was before and it bounces back into casual, episodic adventures once again. But actually not for long, because the final stretch of the season, spoiler alert, is another serialized arc just like this. So there are only eight standalone episodes in this entire season, right here in the middle. Remember how Lab Rats had a very balanced pattern of keystone and filler episodes? Well, Mighty Med's version of the chart looks like this. And that's so funny to me, like, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Late in its run did this thing where it introduced pods. It split every season into three clear-cut arcs so nothing would be dragged out and the pace would be well maintained. And it was hailed by critics as, as a genius idea. But the thing is, Mighty Med literally figured this out half a decade earlier and I don't see it getting the proper credit it deserves. Let's go through the standalone episodes quickly and efficiently because people on Twitter will complain that this video is too long. Future Tense is a cautionary tale about how small choices change the future in big ways. Future Kaz comes from the future to the past to stop Oliver from becoming a villain. I was sent here to stop someone from turning into a villain in the future and destroying the world. Cool. So who's the villain? You are. <laughs> this is Oliver 25 years from now, using a human body as a canoe. Since the thing I do that's supposed to turn me evil happens today, I can just sit here and do nothing, and it'll never happen. It just happened. <laughs> well, sitting on the gurney was only the first link in a chain of events that leads to a life of crime and destruction. Well, what's the next link? That, asking that question. <laughs> Followed by scoffing like that. But since he didn't pay attention, he doesn't remember what specifically he was supposed to stop from happening. Then the typical Mighty Med who the hell came up with this plot twist happens about halfway through the episode. Hey! That's my, my second, second favorite, favorite shirt! Huh. <laughs> ah, looks like spraying that shirt has altered the future. Oliver doesn't grow up to be a villain anymore. Ha! That's great! 
But now I'm a villain! Now, it's up to Kaz and Oliver to battle future Kaz and redeem him. Meanwhile, everyone hates Skylar because she turned them evil. And Alan revels in being only the second most hated person in the hospital. She only shoved me. She used to scramble my insides with gamma rays. I'm so popular now! <laughs> Skylar tries to restore her reputation and repeatedly fails. I won't be the most hated person at Mighty Med anymore. What?! I'm going to give presents to all the superheroes and staff at Mighty Med. What?! Deep down, you're kind of a sweetheart. I'm not a sweetheart. I said kind of a sweetheart. I said someone in check. In Stop Bugging Me, Captain Atomic returns to the hospital, infected by the venom of a dangerous Venusian beetle. They cure him, he's fine, etc. That's important for later. Kaz and Oliver continue having trust issues. Oliver has to go help the squad with a science project at school, but he doesn't trust Kaz enough to leave him alone at Mighty Med. Are you good? If by good you mean good at spinning in my chair, then you tell me. They fight. Kaz tells Oliver to stop being a control freak, and they part ways. The kids are doing a science project about energy conservation, and Oliver is very particular that they follow his lead on the project, because their ideas simply won't work. Jordan is noticeably and criminally absent from this one because they now have Alan going to school and can write him into the scripts instead. Cringe. When Oliver forgets something and has to head back to Mighty Med, Kaz blows up on him, calling him a control freak. And then Oliver proves him right when he sets up a webcam to spy on Kaz. He sees a dangerous Venusian beetle about to attack Kaz, and once again he rushes back to the hospital. If it bites Kaz, its toxins will make him lose control of his emotions, and within two minutes, he'll die! And it turns out that Kaz merely set him up and had the superhero Replicate turn into a beetle because he knew Oliver was spying on him and would come to see him. Drama. Wow! Back at school, the kids decide to disregard Oliver's idea and take a different approach, which turns out to be a horrible failure. I was getting so bored, I was starting to somewhat pay attention to what these two were saying. You're just staring off into space. I said somewhat pay attention! <laughs> we just need to move faster. And I know exactly how we can do that. <laughs> At the hospital, Oliver is actually attacked by a Venusian beetle. It's cool looking. Look at that thing. Is that a prop? I don't know. They apologize and make up. The end. Surely they'll never fight again. Back at school, the group has decided to go with Oliver's project idea, because um, all of theirs were exhausting failures, but then Oliver destroys his and says that he is ready to be a team player and go with theirs. How humorous! How silly was that ending? And less than hero, an off-screen Dr. Bridges is dissatisfied that the hospital has not been treating enough superheroes. So Horace decides to drastically lower the bar for what gets accepted as a superhero, and they hold tryouts for all the loser superhumans with pointless powers to audition to be a hero. Your comic book expertise will be useful in judging superheroes. What?! An ambulance driver named Fred, who has the power to skip super fast, convinces Kaz to let him become a superhero in exchange for giving Kaz the keys to the invisible ambulance. <laughs> Alright, now, let's see how fast this thing goes. <laughs> Oliver and Skylar have a dance battle competition at the Domain, and Oliver is extremely jealous when she's better than him in every conceivable way. When Kaz, Alan, and Fred get captured in the Amazon rainforest by a villain called the Ambusher, Oliver and Skylar have to arrive and put their new dance skills to the test to defeat the Ambusher once and for all. Oh. <laughs> 
in Season 2, Episode 11, simply titled Oliver Hatches the Eggs, when a pregnant superhero called Arachnia is damaged by a bounty hunter in battle, her sack of eggs attaches itself to Oliver as an instinctive defense mechanism. So now, Oliver is pregnant. Oliver has to hide the fact that he's pregnant at school. I can't believe we're wearing the same outfit! Oh, this is so embarrassing. And defend himself against Hunter Bounty the Bounty Hunter, who's seeking to claim the eggs as his ultimate prize. Horace, fearing that a once again off-screen Dr. Bridges is about to close down the hospital. To be fair, the last time she was here, she was almost eaten alive by a man shark. She was fine. I said almost eaten alive! Decides that filming the birth would be the best way to prove the hospital's importance, as well as filming a mini-documentary showing all the good they do. Can I just hold one or 200 of them? <laughs> oh! <laughs> take him, take him, so gross, so gross! It turns out that he simply misread the email and the hospital was never in danger of closing down. Are you okay? Yes, yes, I just have a little something in my eye. Tears, lots and lots of tears, because I'm crying. In Sparks Fly, Kaz falls in love with a teenage superhero named Spark. They hand it off, they have a picnic up in the clouds, they're the perfect couple. Until Spark reveals herself as a possessive, insane, and overly controlling girlfriend. Yeah, dinner at seven. Yeah, and I'll be- Who are you talking to? You have another girlfriend? And you're going to dinner with her after our date? No, my phone! <laughs> that boyfriend stealing floozy a ripper face right off her head that boyfriend stealing floozy was my mother Kaz fakes his death because he's too afraid to break up with her <sighs> all right uh thank you all for coming to Kaz's funeral I'm pretending to be dead <laughs> I think this is a terrible idea it's in poor taste and it can only end badly well, I think it's a brilliant idea, is in fine taste, and can only end goodly. This is boring. Isn't there another funeral we can watch? <laughs> I'm changing the channel. Stop it. <laughs> it's my funeral, and I want to watch it. When Spark comes to confront Kaz at school, her arch enemy, Night Strike, arrives. This is just Nightwing. This actor was apparently the one who physically played the Annihilator in all of his appearances, so isn't that a fun fact? The battle's epic, intense, crazy, wow. Gotta go fast. In the B-plot, Skyler points out that security at the hospital is extremely lax. Get better guards? I mean, the ones we have are a bunch of dummies. Are you talking about me or him? <laughs> Another reason I deserve to make more than him! And puts herself in charge of increasing security, accidentally turning the hospital incredibly dangerous with all of her unnecessary security <gasps> measures. Do you guys mind if I take these boxes? I'm looking for a new place to live. That's weird. My password won't work. Ah! Ah! Henderson! Are you just gonna stand there? Help him! Hey. Why won't this thing turn on? Oh, whew. That was close. Why would you put an alarm on that? The weird thing is, I didn't. This is the funniest show of all time. Wallace and Clyde, A Grand Day Out, is 
according to the wiki, possibly a reference to Wallace and Gromit a grand day out. Like, obviously it's a reference. Magnesium 7, do better! Oliver has been in charge of rehabilitating Wallace and Clyde, and now they're ready to be released into the world. Oliver has to convince Horace that they're no longer evil and no longer seeking to destroy him. There's no money in here. Nothing's changed at all! So when do we get snacks? I believe there was talk of juice boxes? Wallace? Clyde stole my juice box. <laughs> Creepy but harmless. That's how I described myself on my dating profile. When Oliver turns around for a moment, it seems as though they've destroyed Horace. <laughs> you just integrated Horace, what happened? Wallace, Clyde stole my mini cheesecake. <laughs> They have to prove their innocence. This leads them down a rabbit trail, and they have to discover the true culprit, the Exterminator. It's obvious what happened here. The Exterminator was spying on us from outside. The moment you left to get your mini cheesecakes, he made his move. Wait, wait, wait. Why are you wearing tuxedos? It's our reenactment. We can wear whatever we want. When you left the room, the Exterminator snuck in blasted us with his neuralizer toxin, abducted Horace Diaz, and made it look like we disintegrated him. My goodness, even unconscious, those are two of the handsomest, most well-dressed twin comic book store owners I've ever seen. <laughs> he didn't say that. He might have said that. You weren't there. Patton Oswalt is angry deeply regretting his role in Red Letter Media's Space Cop. Chief of Space Police, out. Do I, do I sign out? Because he's still, if he see, if, if I'm seeing him, does he see me? Because he's still on. Also wanting revenge on Wallace and Clyde for ruining his birthday last year in lockdown from season one. That was exactly one year ago today, and once again, it is my birthday, which, hang on, did you, is this a surprise party for me? <laughs> oh, hey, yes. Yes. yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And here are the refreshments. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys are the best. <laughs> this is empty, <laughs> and you know I love Frazzleberry. <laughs> Actually, there's a little bit left. We then revisit a series of flashbacks over and over to sort out what happened. I was spying on Wallace and Clyde. The moment you left, I made my move. Hold on. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not what happened. When you left the room, I blasted everyone with my neuralizer toxin, abducted Horace, and then made it look like Wallace disintegrated him. <laughs> <sighs> okay, my dear. Let's go back to my mansion and feed each other nachos. Wait, why would you put such an embarrassing moment in your own reenactment? Still a lot better than real life. Okay, in real life I had to walk home because, because someone stole my bicycle. They're able to defeat him and the newly redeemed domain owners are set loose into the world. Where's my medal? I participated! I don't have one here, but uh, you can have one in your reenactment. <laughs> What's the matter? In my reenactment, Clyde stole my medal. <laughs> Sadly, this is their last appearance in the show. I thought for sure they'd show up in the finale or something. Catastrophe joins the heroes in the fight against whoever the new threat is, but tragically, that was not the case. Bye Wallace and Clyde, I miss you. Back in Mighty Med, Philip brings his pet camel, Camilla Anderson, to work. Kaz believes that drinking Camilla Anderson's milk will give him superpowers, and so he sets out to do as much. Unfortunately, he doesn't pay attention, and Camilla Anderson drinks medicine, causing her to shoot lasers and go on a rampage. There's also a giant insect that grows for some reason. I don't remember why. I refuse to re-watch it. There have been three bug-themed episodes out of the last five, 
but only one of them was called Stop Bugging Me. All three of them should have been called that, in my opinion. Uh, well, what's the future like? Mm, pretty much exactly the same as now, except we're ruled by giant insects. You know what, though? They're actually doing a pretty good job. In the end, it turns out that Camilla Anderson drinking the medicine didn't cause her laser eyes. She's simply a laser camel and is normal. As soon as the bug showed up, I immediately called that the exterminator would interact with it somehow, and I was right. I can give you an estimate, but we're looking at big numbers. <laughs> The key to being a hero is the second episode in a row where Kaz really wants powers. In the aforementioned Lab Rats vs. Mighty Med crossover, which is coming up quite soon, Kaz wanting powers is his primary character motivation, and I assume that'd be an essential part of his character from the beginning of Mighty Med. But in reality, it was only introduced as an idea a few episodes before the crossover. The Key Keeper 8 has decided to retire, and will give the magical power-granting Key of Steel to a worthy successor, as Key Keeper 7 did for him. Kaz and Skylar both compete to be deemed worthy of it. While Key Keeper ultimately chooses Skylar, Kaz decides to steal it, and finds himself attacked at the domain by the Key Keeper's mortal enemy, Slaughter Master. <laughs> This is the one weapon that can destroy the Keykeeper. What if I wasn't the Keykeeper? Ultimately, neither are deemed worthy due to their constant fighting. I have my moments. Oliver, meanwhile, is going out to dinner with his mom in order to meet her new boyfriend. Yes, after 40 episodes of mere fleeting mentions of parents existing somewhere in the universe, we finally meet Oliver's mother, Bridget. And I was originally concerned because I love the charm of their parents being completely irrelevant and absent from the show, but my concerns were alleviated because I like what the show did with Bridget here. I never noticed this establishing shot! No! I would have gone to this! So, Oliver meets the new boyfriend. Oh, here he comes. Oliver? <laughs> you two know each other? No! Of course not! I'm just very good at guessing people's names! And weights! Byron, 280. Sorry, it's work. I have to take this. Okay, why doesn't my one favorite boy get to know my other favorite boy and... <laughs> the boy who just ate that woman's bruschetta? <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> Why is Alan pretending to be your son? Because women are total suckers for a single dad. <laughs> yeah. We lured your mom right in, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> of course, I care for her deeply. I love Bridget! At the end of the episode, we learn that Horace and Bridget are engaged. What? Setting the stage for the next serialized storyline that will soon begin. Creepy but harmless. That's how I described myself on my dating profile. And next up, The New Kids Are The Docs is a stupid episode, and I love everything about it. Just when Oliver and Kaz nervously discuss asking for their first raise amid layoffs... Dude, we're irreplaceable. There is no one else like us here. <laughs> Whoa! Look at this place! <laughs> Two new normos, named Gulliver and Chaz, wander into Mighty Med and impress Horace, who hires them on the spot. They show up Oliver and Kaz at every turn and basically just reenact stuff that they did throughout season one. Yeah, when he was exposed to the Aldebaran Crystal, his mortal weakness. Which can only be cured by a massive negative, negative electrical, electrical charge. charge. Horace, we figured it out! <laughs> As they threaten to completely take their jobs, Oliver and Kaz become jealous and suspicious. Maybe they're evil. What are they up to? We're supposed to think that they're being ridiculous, but then they're right. Gulliver and Chaz reveal themselves as supervillains who attempt to have Horace use his final Caduceo power to revive their fallen evil mentor by tricking Horace into thinking Alan has died. Well, can't you do something? Maybe call Caduceo? 
I don't need to call him. I am him! Anatoly Bios! Poor Dokes! That's not Alan. What are you talking about? It's Dr. Rath's ashes. Look. Freeze, new boys! He reflected my power! My freezing hand is frozen! I am so good at irony. Kaz and Oliver are finally able to prove that Chaz and Gulliver are guilty, and they're taken away. Skyler says that implementing a suggestion box might increase staff morale, but it winds up completely destroying staff morale, sending the hospital into anarchy until the suggestion box gets destroyed. Very good content all around. And that's it. Those are the eight standalone episodes of Mighty Med Season 2. But before we jump into the final storyline of the season, the Lab Rats versus Mighty Med crossover event is almost here. Yep. Name's Dooley, bionic screening agent. State the purpose of your visit. Well, I was thinking maybe a Lab Rats Mighty Med team-up mission. What is it that you do exactly? Well, at Mighty Med, I save people who save people. What do we do? We can save. Look, we are bionic. We have been on some seriously dangerous and ridiculous missions. <laughs> never know because we got skills son you don't have any skills next be here for the lab rats versus mighty med crossover event premiering wednesday july 22nd at 8 30 on disney xd stop I just want let me guess you want to learn as much as you can about bionics hmm well, I thought. We've got one episode to talk about. Technically two. It's the two-part crossover between Lab Rats and Mighty Med. The first half being a episode and the second half being a Mighty Med episode. So let's walk through it with a new perspective having seen Mighty Med that we didn't have in the last video. At this point in life, the bionic teenagers are living on an advanced bionic island academy. Living on a bionic island. And training the next generation of bionic students. Our leads are Leo, bionic arm and protagonist. Adam, super strength and stupid. Chase, super intelligence and unbearable asshole. And Bree, super speed and girl. Their father is Donald Davenport. The richest tech genius in the world, who just bought Twitter and frankly needs no other introduction. When Chase and Davenport co-invent a new energy transference device, Davenport takes full control of his distribution, sending a jealous Chase into a series of bad decisions. Chase decides to strike up a deal with literally just some guy who hops off the hydro loop train, who claims to be a fancy investor. Meanwhile, oh my god, it's Oliver and Kaz, they're in lab rat! Kaz wants powers, and he's hoping to instill himself with bionics. They have to blend in as students for a while before they're eventually found out. Other people's brains with my brain! What's your ability? I have the same ability! Seriously? <laughs> Suddenly, Tecton and Rock Guy and Plant Girl arrive. The first time around during the Lab Rats review, I assumed all of these were significant characters, uh, but they definitely just chose two random extras from the hospital to fight against the protagonists of the other show. So there's your typical crossover misunderstanding fight, and man, they nerfed the superheroes here. Literally every single superhero in Mighty Med could single-handedly defeat Adam, Bree, and Chase with like a thing with a with a with, like. <sighs> we can get the Crusher. He's the strongest man in the universe. Show him, Crusher. Adam is easily as strong as that. Show him, Adam. 
<sighs> but apparently they're all equally matched in this crossover, so sure. They all realize who their real enemy is. The fancy investor is, in fact, the terrifying villain called the Incapacitator, who incapacitates Chase and escapes with the energy transponder. With Chase in critical condition, the follow Kaz and Oliver back to Mighty Med for part two. In the second part, now an episode of Mighty Med, Adam, Oliver, Skylar, and Bree hunt down the Incapacitator while Kaz and Leo attempt to cure Chase. Kaz has to absorb Chase's intelligence to find a cure, but the resulting operation leaves Chase with a dangerous virus that'll make him explode if his anxiety spikes. That sentence was a subtle verbal reference to Spike from Remember that? The show forgot about him, except for once per season when it didn't. Bree and Skylar are having a passive-aggressive grudge match regarding their love for Oliver. And after watching Mighty Mad, it's like, what? Why on earth would Skylar be fighting for Oliver? He has a crush on her, and she's only barely vaguely on board with it sometimes. She would not be fighting Bree for Oliver's affection. In fact, all of the Mighty Med characters just feel very flat in this crossover. This crossover had really been my only impression of the show before this, and it made Mighty Med feel like a watered-down Lab Rats rip-off. Kaz and Oliver don't really show their personalities because they're not really given anything fun to do, but the guys feel exactly the same. It feels like the guys handled this crossover, and the Mighty Med guys had little to no input. Foreshadowing? All forces converge at the Las Vegas, Nevada Eiffel Tower. We just drove to California during a fuel crisis. We're not going to Vegas too. Don't tell him how much gasoline costs now. It'll kill him! Into darkness. Just imagine we're here. I'll Photoshop myself in. Oh my God, it's like we're really there. We really went to, to Vegas. The incapacitator is a scary and powerful man. But when he absorbs Chase's virus, he explodes. A fun fact that this commenter pointed out is that Damien Poultier literally played Thanos at the end of the first Avengers movie before getting recast with Josh Brolin. So the Lab Rats and Mighty Med guys literally just defeated Thanos? He's currently playing Goldface in The Flash Season 8, so I guess they also just defeated the iconic DC villain Goldface. Back at the hospital, Brees stops having a crush on Oliver when she realizes he reminds her of Chase. I'm gonna miss you. You're so smart and kind. And you remind me of someone, but I just can't think of who. Oh, is it Thomas the Tank Engine? I get that a lot. I mean, I mean personality-wise, I'm not a train. It's someone I know. He reminds me of Chase, your brother. Yes, Chase! You remind me of Chase! You remind me of Chase, ew! <laughs> Okay, epic conclusion to that storyline. Everyone says their goodbyes, and the adventure draws to a close. The doors open automatically. Not anymore. <laughs> Bree just dragged that rickshaw through a public hospital. She probably had to get into an elevator with that rickshaw. The worlds of Lab Rats and Mighty Med clearly just weren't meant to collide. Their universes simply weren't meant to handle each other. Agent Graham and Lab Rats makes it very clear that nothing wacky or wild has ever existed beyond the Bionic Kids. Special Agent Graham, I run a top secret division that investigates abnormal global phenomena. You know, strange creatures, paranormal activity, unusual occurrences. Wow. So that stuff really exists. Nope, none of it. So this crossover retroactively makes Graham seem absolutely, totally incompetent, which is sort of at odds with his characterization as a force to be reckoned with in that show. Lab Rats is a purely science-based world, whereas Mighty Med is completely fantastical and magical, and there's no real attempt to explain or acknowledge how these could coexist. But it was a hit! 1.07 million viewers! Which is more than Lab Rats had gotten in the last year or so, and more than Mighty Med had gotten ever before. And the executives may have noticed. <laughs> and now, we enter that final serialized arc of the season, although it isn't clear at first. 
Season 2, Episode 16, It's a Matter of Principle, introduces a new establishing shot out of nowhere! But also, Jordan is still obsessed with her encounter with Tekton in the opening arc of Season 2. She insists to Kaz and Oliver that the school's new history teacher is secretly a superhero from the comic books. And they find that ridiculous until they realize that Captain Atomic is, in fact, the school's new history teacher. Going undercover because a secret villain from an undercover villain league is suspected to be operating out of the school. This storyline again. 50 stars? Since when? <laughs> As Jordan becomes obsessed with outing him, Captain Atomic proves to be an overbearing and embarrassing teacher. So Kaz and Oliver decide to get him fired by having their principal do his robot impression that he did last year at a talent show. <laughs> what are you <laughs> doing? Get off of me! <laughs> Not until I unhinge your robot head! <laughs> we all make mistakes. Just none as stupid as this one, so you're fired. <laughs> get out. This is what I love about Mighty Men, because in any other sitcom, that loose premise would serve as the structure for a whole episode. But here, it's just Act 1. In the B-plot, Stephanie's back! And she's here to blackmail Connie. You know how I do extensive background checks on everyone at school so I can find out their most embarrassing secrets and then bend them to my will? Here's your dry cleaning, Stephanie. When I did my internet check on you, I found out there is no Connie Valentine. It's a fake identity. It's not what you think. It's exactly what I think. You're not who you say you are. You're actually a princess from another country who's here living in hiding. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> uh. If anyone here was a princess in hiding, I would have guessed it was Genevieve. Nope, she's just weird. Skylar now has to convince Stephanie that she's a foreign princess hiding in the US to escape from rebels attempting to take the throne of her home country. Principal Howard becomes interested in Jordan's insistence that superheroes are real. Because he's an actual robot sent to the school by the Secret Villain League! Are you one of the Normos from Mighty Med or do you work for the League of Heroes? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh! Hey, Jordan. What's going on? <laughs> uh, rope tying class? It's a new elective? <laughs> and I'm really bad at it. I need help! A lot of help! She manages to call Kaz and Oliver, who have to get back in contact with Captain Atomic and have him come rescue Jordan. Skylar joins the battle as well, and when Principal Howard begins to get the upper hand in combat, Stephanie comes in to save the day, mistaking him for a foreign rebel attempting to hurt the princess. Kaz and Oliver get the jump on Howard, tackling him to the ground and removing an operating flash drive. Kaz then does something. Which causes the android's head to explode. And the day is saved. Connie knights Stephanie, and we tragically never see her again. And Jordan now knows about the existence of superheroes, an incredible way of making her character relevant again, giving Jordan new purpose, and allowing new character dynamics to ensue. No, just kidding. Principal Howard knocked her out early on, and she doesn't remember a thing. Yeah, what happened here? I... I can't remember anything. Okay! <laughs> Jordan wanting to prove that superheroes exist is never mentioned again. We could have had the classic best friend learns the secret story, but we never got it. This is where you do inventory? <laughs> this is gonna take a while for it to sink in. The next episode, Living the Dream, does not acknowledge anything from the previous, and it's not obvious that they're connected. It's the next episode that will fundamentally hinge on both of them. Construction is happening at the school, and Oliver has a minor accident. Ah! <laughs> Which leads to him touching a small rock. After receiving countless weird dreams about the rock, and about a spaceship carrying a powerful relic called the Arcturian, he reaches out to Ambrose, 
They've clearly demolished his office set by now, and so they have to justify why he's no longer in there. Ambrose is complaining that the Tecton comic books have been boring lately. I can't help it if I always win so easily. That's not boring, that's consistent. Sales are down and who gets blamed? Me. I've been thrown out of my office and forced to use Lizard Man's back as a desk. <laughs> With comic sales declining, Oliver pitches the events of his dream to Ambrose, and Ambrose decides to incorporate them into the newest Tecton issue, giving Oliver a writing credit to boot. However, because Oliver needs to keep his affiliation with the superhero world a secret, Kaz suggests he use a fake name, Quimby Fletcher, a reference to his Ant Farm character, Fletcher Quimby. The new comic issue is a massive success. Kaz is jealous. Kaz is jealous. Kaz is jealous. Kaz is jealous. Kaz is jealous of Oliver's newfound fame, and insists that since he came up with the name, that makes him Quimby Fletcher as well. That's when two movie producers from Hollywood enter the domain, wanting to make a film about this Arcturian story. Kaz claims to be Quimby Fletcher, and then they kidnap him. They are supervillains. Wait, the Arcturian is real and you're henchmen for some villain? <laughs> I wish. Right now we're just lackeys, hoping to get promoted to goons. <laughs> but if we bring our boss the Arcturian, we skip goon and go straight to henchmen. <laughs> In the B-plot, Alan tries to suck up to Horace to become the best man at his wedding, and Horace does everything in his power to not let this happen. When Mort the Lackey and the other Lackey hook Kaz up to a machine to read his dream, they don't see the Arcturian story, and they come to realize that he isn't Quimby Fletcher at all, because none of his dreams are remotely close to the comic. Hi, Kaz. Oh, hi, Sunflower Kaz. <laughs> oh, watch out for that pile of... Uh. Oh, hi, dog mess, Kaz. <laughs> Kaz, however, doesn't reveal Quimby Fletcher's real identity, and Tecton arrives just in time to save him. Kaz and Oliver make up again, and realize that Principal Howard and Mort both had similar markings on their wrists, implying that they're from the same League of Villains. Mort then meets up with his boss, Mr. Terror, who states that he has one more chance to find the Arcturian and bring him Quimby Fletcher's head. Yeah, this is what I get for sending lackeys to do a henchman's job. And technically, both of those episodes came out before the Lab Rats vs. Mighty Med one, but, but you know, what are you gonna do? I gotta structure this video, what are you- What are you gonna do? Arrest me? In Thanks for the Memory Drives, the previously on Mighty Med segment is, in itself, a joke. Thanks, Flashback, for showing those clips to Skylar. <laughs> This show, the kids interrogate Principal Howard's captive head, and he reveals that all the information they need is on the flash drive they had extracted behind his ear. They head to the school to reclaim it, expecting an easy search for it on a weekend, but are shocked to discover that there's a school art fair, and Gus made hundreds of replicas of the drive as earrings. Only like four or five. <sighs> hundred. <laughs> Complicating the matter is the fact that the flash drive is programmed to explode if disconnected from the host for too long. Now, Oliver and Kaz have to devise a plan to make everyone abandon the earrings and find the drive before it's too late. I put on your cheap earring and it must be defective. It made my ear swell up. Yeah, and that's, that's not the only side effect. It also makes her run repeatedly into walls. <laughs> 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 
Oliver, Ellen, Horace, and Bridget try on costumes to prepare for the wedding, preventing Oliver from helping out Kaz and Skylar. Are you kidding me? There's another one! Uh theme wedding? What theme? We haven't decided. We have 50 outfits to try on! <laughs> oh, excuse me. Do you have a dinosaur costume in a men's regular? I think we should have a family feeling session because there's nothing more important than family. Right, Mom? Oh, that's so sweet that you called me Mom. <laughs> Don't do it again. Mort and another goon show up to find the drive first, battling the kids through the exact same hallway in the school that every other battle takes place in. <laughs> Kaz manages to use the enlarging ray to save the day, defeating Mort again. Also, this was Jordan's final appearance. Bye, Jordan! Back at Mighty Med, with the flash drive installed into Principal Howard, the kids realize that the Arcturian is actually buried under their school. That's why villains have constantly been drawn to their high school so many times throughout the series. The powerful relic is there, beneath the surface, its evil presence drawing everyone in. Maybe when you fell into the construction site, you touched something that had been in contact with the Arcturian, and that's why you had the dream. That's why there's so much villain activity at this school. Villains are drawn to the Arcturian's power without even knowing why, like moths to the light. How is that the best read of that line? Now, the kids know where they have to go next. All that's left to do is find the Arcturian and bring it home. Meanwhile, at Mr. Terror's lair... dear. Yes, you can go for pizza. Well, I don't care if you're walking, you still need to wear a helmet. Oh, I know you think I'm being overprotective, but you don't realize that the world is a very dangerous place. In the final episode before the finale, The Dirt on Kaz and Skylar, Kaz and Skylar tunnel beneath Logan High School to find the crashed spaceship. Why don't they have a superhero do this for them? Not sure. Unfortunately, they run into Gus, who has accidentally left his locker at school. I bring my entire locker home with me every night so I don't forget anything that's in my locker. But you forgot your entire locker. I didn't say it was a perfect system. What are you guys digging for? We're not digging for anything. We're, um, filling this hole. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, people keep falling in it. See? They're able to enter the ship and find the Arcturian, but before they can get out... Must be Mr. Terra's henchmen! They're covering up the escape hatch, it's too heavy to open! There's no way out? I bet it's Mr. Terra himself! Only a sick, <laughs> twisted person can do something this evil! And Connie, I wanted to help you fill your ditch, so I borrowed a bobcat. It was just lying around my neighbor's backyard next to this unfinished swimming pool shaped hole. Oliver is tired of hiding from Mr. Terror, and he opts to host a Quimby Fletcher book signing to lure Mort to him. Megahertz is working corrections to reduce his sentence, and he agrees to be Oliver's bodyguard for the day. Why wouldn't Oliver just reach out to another superhero? Not sure. Technically, because the Season 2 premiere made itself non-canon, this is the first time we've seen Megahertz in Season 2. He disguises Megahertz as Solar Storm and sneaks him to the Domain, where, sure enough, Mort shows up, a battle ensues, and Oliver ultimately gets a hold of Mort's phone. Kaz and Skylar decide to fly the ship out of the ground, but Baker about how. We should push this button because it looks like a key, and a key starts an engine. And I think we should push this button because it's closer. Above ground, Megahertz and Oliver arrive to meet up with them. But Megahertz is immediately drawn towards the massive evil power of the Arcturian. 
He turns on them last minute, attempting to steal it for himself, but is quickly dispatched by Gus, who returned to the school because he forgot his backpack. I forgot my backpack. Also, I'm looking for my bobcat. It's right there. <laughs> no, my other bobcat. <laughs> Oh, there she is. Okay, I want to see what they all look like now. In the Lab Rats video I did that, it was shocking, it was unexpected. Let's go. Okay. Bradley Stephen Perry looks the same. Good for him. Dad! Is he a dad? Or is he just... Did he just find a child to hold? <laughs> oh, God. He looks like the guy on your college campus that you really just would go out of your way to not talk to. What the hell? How is this even the same person? Here's a whole interview she did where she just talks about her boyfriend the whole time. Ah, that's my boyfriend! <laughs> um, so that was our first Christmas together. I don't know, I feel like I've, I've been through a couple relationships and this is the first one where it seems like a little more mature and um, it's like my first healthy relationship. Um, he's Amazing, he's my angel. Okay, I was fully expecting Augie Isaac to have like a full Neville Longbottom transformation glow up. He didn't quite have that, but he seems very nice. And that's what matters. Let's we'll see what his net worth is. Oh, he's my age. 1.2 billion? How the hell is he worth one fourth of Lucasfilm? I look up Cozy and then Zulsdorf is the only corresponding last name because no one else is named Cozy. Oh, yo, she had that one haircut at one point. Oh, she had those round glasses that don't have a function. Those ones are cool. Good for her. Looks like she's doing well. Um, okay, they still look the same, but like they're, I don't know, they're like 30 or 40, so they're just gonna perpetually look the same until they start to become old. Ooh, I think they're starting, maybe. <gasps> oh no, 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 he's old! No! No, 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 Horus is- They need to reboot now. There is no time to lose. Oh, that's devastating. NFT profile picture! Oh, it's a hexagon! NFT PR expert Devin Leos. Oh, retweeting Elon. It's a married man. He looks the exact same. All of the other cast members follow each other on Twitter, but none of them follow him. What? What? Attempted murder case? This was two years ago. Okay, so first I gotta apologize to John Leland because he asked me to come over and play video games right now and, uh, you see, I'm hungover and I can't do that. Uh, I feel like shit right now. But to answer everybody's question, did I try to murder somebody? Uh, no, I have PTSD and, uh, this dude that fucking, like, attacked me and my friend and tried to kill us and he had a knife and, like, everything and he was on meth, uh, I, like, tried to run him over with my car. So yeah, the guy was like super methed out and he was like, he was kicking my car so hard that it was like starting to get dented and like the dude had like super strength. And so like, of course, me, you know, what are you staring at? I I I'm gonna use my fucking car to, to try to, you know, stop the situation. Like, what do you want me to do? Yes, I should have ran away, but like when you're in that moment, you know what I mean? The adrenaline's pumping, you're just in fight or flight, and your brain's in fight mode? I mean, sorry. It's called PTSD, people. Oh my god. Okay, so he drove a car at a man in a 7-Eleven parking lot, as you do. He had to complete 120 hours uh, of community service. Oh my god. So, in the show... Devin Leos wasn't really acting. He was just playing himself. Oh my god. <laughs> September 9th. We cannot let the Arcturian get into the wrong hands. Do we have powers? We must have absorbed some of its energy. An object of unspeakable power. It's starting to attract every villain on the planet. Uncovers a secret. You have to face the truth. You'll have to see it to believe. We have to stop her. This is the episode you've been waiting for. No, no, no. 
The Mighty Men One Hour Event. Brand new Wednesday, September 9th at 8, only on Disney XD. And now we've reached the series finale of Mighty Men. Let's go! The day of Horace and Bridget's wedding has come, and the families are staying at a hotel. <laughs> tries to unlock Mort's phone and get his contact information to learn Mr. Terror's identity, while Kaz concocts a plan with Philip to fly the Arcturian off-world. We finally learn the history of the Arcturian. It and Philip are from a planet called ah! My Home Planet of ah! A scientist created it long ago, but due to its danger and power, a pilot was tasked with flying the Arcturian into the nearest sun. Philip was that pilot and he completely failed, losing the shuttle and never seeing it again, completely outcasting him from the populace of <laughs> But now, with an opportunity to finish what he started, Philip works with Kaz to restore the engine and restore his honor. It's time to make you proud, President Headley. <laughs> Let me guess, he was elected because of the size of his head? No, in spite of it. He has the second smallest head on my planet. Due to an unfortunate backpack mix-up, the kids wind up with the Arcturian at the Domain, where a Slaughter Master, Night Strike, and that one from the Debbie Ryan episode attack them in a new back alley set. Can't you guys read the sign? We're closed! Which is not what the exterior of the cannery actually looked like. This escalator doesn't work at all, it's just stairs. The thugs get corrupted by the Arcturian's power and opt to battle each other instead, allowing the kids to get back to Mighty Men. Alan is looking for the perfect wedding present. This looks like a fantastic wedding present. <laughs> he doesn't know what it is, he just thinks a shiny pyramid would be a good present. Where's the Arcturian? He was here just a minute ago. It's Oliver. The wedding starts in 20 minutes. What? You were invited? I figured no one from work was. <laughs> Even Henderson was invited? And back at the hotel, Oliver discovers the truth. Oh, it's just one of my employees, Mort. Your mother is Mr. Terror? This may have been a better plot twist if they didn't already tell us, but whatever. I'll let it slide because I like this show. And there the kids stand, terrified in their hotel room. And here it is. This commenter identified that this is the Warner Center Marriott by Woodland Hills, just outside of Los Angeles, California. And now that we look at it, we're not quite sure if this is the same one. There's no fountain here, as you can see in the show. Either that was edited in, which I doubt they had the budget for or the desire to, or they, maybe they used to have a fountain and removed it eventually, um, or this is the wrong place entirely. But either way, you know, we're on the right track. And a lot of people also pointed out that this exact same hotel stock footage was used in an episode of Good Luck Charlie. Well, Charlie, as you can see... Everyone here is rich. Like, the average person at this hotel is richer than the richest person in the town I live in. Like, this is insane. As a high schooler, I didn't spend any of my work paychecks, so guess what we're gonna say tonight? What? Hotel has 17 floors. It's bigger than the hallway in my house. Let's go. My kings. Vlog update. We just discovered my fly was down when we booked the room in the lobby. It's not my greatest moment, but it's not my worst moment either. In part two of the finale, Alan reveals that he took the Arcturian as his wedding gift, and the kids search desperately to find it. This must be it! A bunt pan? <laughs> At the wedding, Gus is the priest, by the way. Gus is the priest. Optimo stands up and objects to the union. And Horace, and his son, Alan. Alan is not his son. He's my son. <gasps> what? I've always known I was your father. I don't understand. If you knew, then why didn't you take care of me? Or teach me how to throw a ball? I mean, look at this. Alan basically holds him and Horace captive up in the room and demands that he spend 15 minutes with him. One for each year of his life he missed. 
No one's going anywhere. And since I have the wedding rings, the ceremony can't continue without me. Those are onion rings. Wrong pocket. I don't want any excuses. What I want is for you to make up for the last 15 years that I spent without a dad. Right now. 15 years? Alan, please. We barely have 15 minutes. I'll take it. One minute for every year of my life. And we actually get, like, closure and a full circle for Alan's character, which is just something you don't really see in sitcoms often, especially not Disney Channel original sitcoms. Thanks, Dad. Eight-year-old me loves pillow forts. Alan had a character arc with a very natural progression of beginning, middle, and end. He changed as a person in a tangible and organic way that was clearly planned out, not just the writers changing their mind on the character's personality. I guess he jumped ahead to his teenage years. <laughs> it's just really refreshing to see after watching... Huge vlog update. I can't stop thinking about the fountain discrepancy, so we're gonna go ask the hotel people who live here. We're going to floor L. Plus ratio. We're good. We have, I guess, an oddly specific <laughs> question. So, um, like 10 years ago or something, there was a Disney show that used a stock photo of this hotel as an establishing shot, essentially. And so there is this, in the actual video, there's this fountain out in front of it. And so we were wondering, we noticed there is not a fountain there. Um, was, was this a stock photo of a different hotel or was that just removed at one point? So a, a Disney show used, yeah, a Disney show used a stock photo of this hotel like as just an establishing shot. And so we think it's this one. That's like basically the whole reason we're here because we're just doing like a, a YouTube deep dive of this hotel. Okay, cool. So do you know of this fountain? Yeah. Looks like there used to be a. The park right here, you see the light poles right there. Yeah, yeah. And this, like, across by that building, that's the, that's oh, the shot they made. So, is there a fountain over there? Yeah, there was a, I didn't see a fountain out there. I don't Ooh. use Disney Plus. Yeah, do you that's, know that's, that's the main, oh, there's a little fountain down there. I guess if I play it for a second, that'll go away. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, that's what we find interesting. Is yeah. Isn't, this is a really dumb question. If there's, like, that's most likely gone. that's... An old, like a really old, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. That's what we were thinking. Yeah, that's right, an cool. old one. That, because as far as I know, there's there hasn't been a fountain there. All right, cool. <laughs> yes. Well, thank no you for answering that dumb question. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Have a good one. All right, cool. well, look at this, boys. Okay, three, three years ago, this video was uploaded in 2018. As you can see, well, I guess you can't. Oh yeah, May 2018. And then look, look, look. Okay. It shows the fountain on the outside of the hotel. So, as recently as 2018, it was still there. Do you think it's possible the hotel solely removed the fountain to confuse Mighty Med internet historians? I do believe so. Excellent. Oliver rushes down to reveal that he knows his mom's identity. You are my handsome, brilliant, but somewhat underachieving son, Oliver. I'm also Quimby Fletcher. What? I work with Kaz at Mighty Med for Horace. How could you be Mr. Terror? Tell me! Ten years ago, I was reviewing some top secret files at work, and I discovered that superheroes were real, and that my boss was actually a supervillain named Argento. And then I took over his empire so that no one could ever threaten you again. To create a world where I have total control, so I can protect you. But it's too late. <laughs> And now it's safe in my hands! Don't do this. Please. No! <laughs> Bridget discovers the Arcturian and steals it, but its power is too much for her, killing her. The kids realize that they cannot let Horus use his one remaining Caldusio revive power up on her because she'll be evil when she awakens. What they need to do instead is go seek out Hapax on Caldera, bring him back to Earth and have him drain the evil from her before Horus revives Bridget. Unfortunately- Don't worry, my love. I'll save you. But Uncle Horus, that's your last Caduceo power. You'll never be able to save anyone again. Who better to use it on than Bridget? Bios! B-O-E! Thanatos! 
She's alive! And she's evil. And she roars to life as a cackling, maniacal supervillain, more powerful than any before, revealing that she only sought out Horus so that he would use his final Caldusio power to save her should she die from the Arcturian. This leads to a dramatic final showdown on a bridge. Teach you to leave your car running with no one in it! You gotta stop! I told you, Oliver, I'm doing this all for you. Optimo and Hapax are handily defeated. Sorry to crash your wedding. Dad! <laughs> and she leaves, laughing as she sets out to impose her will on the world. And there is the Sky Bridge set. You see those two like pillars there? That's where they filmed the season two climax. We're still here at LA Center Studios. I think we're gonna get mugged at any moment. I'm terrified out of my mind. So um, we're gonna get out of here. Thanks commenter who uh, pointed that out. I'm just terrified, we're leaving. Honestly, the homeless people were nowhere near as scary as the rich people at that hotel. Giant rich hotels like this, are just an absolute scam. It's $250 for one night. And it's, it's not like these beds are any more comfortable than any other hotel. Then you would be, we we're charged $30 each for the breakfast, which would be complimentary at any other hotel. We have to walk like a million thousand miles to the parking garage. There's no benefit to this over just like a Motel 6 for $100. Like, that's the reason all the rich people are so scared of their taxes getting cut, is because they keep going to, like, expensive hotels like this, you know? Like, if Jeff Bezos just went to, like, Motel 6s, he'd have so much leftover money. He'd be like, yeah, Bernie Sanders, take all of it. Take everything I have. There's this giant, like, stone chess set in their lobby, and it's like you can't even move the pieces. Like, why would you buy a chess set that you can't play? A non-playable chess set? What are you gonna do? Look at it? Like, rich people don't make any sense to me. LA is like 50% concrete and 50% misery. Costs like a million dollars per hour just to breathe. Freeway, more like expensive way. I cannot wait to live here eventually. At the Yo, time! Someone broke the bar. In the time that we've been here. How could my darling Bridget do something so terrible? And on a bridge, no less! That guy looks familiar. And he's so handsome. Dad? Hello, son. What? And then, in the last 30 seconds of the show, I'll, I'll just play it. I'll just play it. When we touched my mom while she was holding the Arcturian, we must have absorbed some of its energy. I did it? I finally have powers! This is... That's it? Yeah, so that's the final episode of Mighty Med. Kaz and Oliver randomly get powers in the last 30 seconds, uh, with Oliver's mom set up as a massive, massive world-ending threat. This was clearly not intended to be a series finale. Jim Bernstein and Andy Schwartz were pretty clearly hoping for a renewal here because this feels like a standard season finale that might have had seven episodes or so spent resolving it at the beginning of season three. It sucks that Mighty Men ended here as well because this show had so much life left in it. It genuinely is a more creative, energetic, and entertaining show than Lab Rats in many, many ways. Which is, again, not something that I thought I would say going into this. I have to wonder if the creative team had any Season 3 plans in mind, but the reality is that we'll likely never know. In my experience of interviewing people in the industry and interning in the industry, people on the animation side of things will excitedly and eagerly tell you anything. They're generally just kinder, happier, and grateful that someone has thought of them to interview them. And thank you, and I really appreciate, uh, like yourself, uh, interviewing uh, me, uh, as you are my first interview. Really? Uh, uh, yeah, I was told before the show started that we'd have all these interviews with the press, 
that didn't really happen. This guy talking is the head writer of his show, by the way. On the live action side of things though, there's a lot of press and they're generally just over it. Networks typically care more about the live action projects and the non-disclosure contracts are just way scarier there. While I have not personally had the pleasure of signing an NDA for an animated project, Signing an NDA for a live action show made me feel like I would get arrested if I breathed. Dan Povenmire can come out and say, yeah, Disney management was terrible when it came to Disney XD, that's the reason why Milo Murphy's Law never found an audience, it was this specific executive's fault, he apologized to us. And Dan Povenmire will be fine, because all the lawyers have their eyes fixed on the live action guys. If I were to ask Jim or Andy, what did you think of Mighty Med getting cancelled? I'd most likely get a very polished answer that doesn't call anyone out in particular and doesn't go into very much detail. But I mean, I think I know what happened. One thing we can clearly see is that the ratings for Mighty Med were steadily declining across two seasons. So too was Lab Rats, except for one spike! The Lab Rats vs Mighty Med crossover. And those executives up top, who love ratings, who love money, they were probably rubbing their hands together and thinking, <laughs> what if they crossed over permanently? Well, we'll probably never get a clear official explanation. It's pretty obvious to me that the executives were chasing that ratings high, salivating at the mouth, and said, <laughs> that's the direction we want to go. And surely every episode of a crossover show would do as well as the first crossover, right? Mighty Med was the greatest show I've ever watched but I never want to watch it again. Jim Bernstein and Andy Schwartz created a show that resonated with millions of kids. Or maybe at least, at least thousands of kids. At least seven kids watched Mighty Med, and it was permanently ingrained in their brains forever, until they forgot about it for 10 years, until this video reminded them of it. This series is a legitimate hidden gem of Disney's catalog, and its legacy will never be forgotten nor tainted. Assuming they don't make a combined spin-off crossover series with Lab Rats that completely destroys Kaz, Oliver, and Skylar's characterizations, blows up the hospital off-screen, kills every other character from Mighty Med off-screen, and never mentions them again. Oh shit. This is the stupidest and least deserving landmark, man. It's called the Golden Gate Bridge. It's red, first of all. It's just some rickety-ass swaying bridge. It's gonna fall down one day, and you know, everyone's gonna be on it. It's gonna be huge news. It's just gonna topple into the ocean below. And it's, this bridge is gonna deserve it, you know? Like, Herbie the Love Bug, he went on this bridge for like one second, and then immediately he tried to jump off of it. He tried to kill himself. That's how terrible this bridge is, man. Bumblebee and the human girl, they had this great relationship, and then at the end of the movie, as soon as he sees this bridge, he just abandons her, man. Like, this bridge has ended relationships, it's destroyed families. Dude, if we do a That's So Raven video, we have to come back here. I hate bridges.